Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're delighted to have you join us today, the second day of our Designing for Empathy virtual summit. Uh, really thrilled to have you joining us. Uh, some of you may be joining us for the first time today, and others of you may be joining us after having participated in yesterday's inspiring first day of the summit or in any of the many workshops we've had over the last couple of weeks. So welcome to all of you from wherever you are in the world. My name is Greg Stevens, and I am thrilled to be joining my colleague, Aliv Goksikdem, uh, for the second year in a row, uh, the virtual summit. I will be your moderator and co-host throughout the program. I do want to remind everybody that our program is being recorded today, and the recordings of each of the components of our virtual summit and workshop will be made available to you after the summit concludes. Also note that I have enabled closed captioning live transcripts. So please, if that is a service that is beneficial to you, take advantage of that. I do want to um, acknowledge before we turn it over to a leaf to officially welcome us uh, that I am here in New York City, and as such, I acknowledge that New York City is on the ancestral Lenape homelands, and so I honor the ancestors of the Lenape peoples who have and continue to be stewards of this land. Also, I want to acknowledge Elif. I know that you're in Washington, D.C., which is the ancestral homeland of the Anacostan peoples. And the city of Washington, D.C. also borders on the ancestral lands of the Piscatawai and Palmonghe peoples. So collectively, we honor and recognize these stewards of the lands. With that said, it is my great pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend, Elif Goksigdem, to introduce today's program. Elif, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. I'm so grateful to Greg for all his uh, hard work with all the planning and the Zoom check-in calls. And it was just really uh, relentless <laughs> and restless work for, uh, for almost a month. So thank you very much, for uh, Greg, for uh, helping me coordinate this again this year and uh, for facilitating it. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge our um, uh, sponsors. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. So uh, our sponsors, the Threshold Society, Glen Cairn Museum, Museum of Us, the Phillips Collection, Seattle Aquarium, Children's Museum of Pittsburgh, Woodland Park Zoo, Culture Connect and the George Washington University Museum and the Textile Museum. Thank you so much for your support. Without your support, this event could not have, have taken place. And I also would like to acknowledge our individual supporters on the next slide, please. Uh, Tom Rockwell, Mary Hall Surface, uh, my brother Fatih Durmush, who does all my illustrations and he's the person responsible for one's logo. Uh, Dr. Zoran Ivsevich Pringle, Michelle Cedars, Dr. Kate Kristen, Catherine Kristen, Makiba Clay, Dr. John Wettenhall, Susan Norton, Alexandra Sherin, Cinnamon Captain Lagutko, Christine McDonald, Dean Fales, Safia Dershade, Elena Sun, and of course Greg. Next slide, please. Uh, before we begin, uh, and I know that we this may be repetitive to some, but I just would like to uh, provide a quick context about our gathering today to, the, to those who are just joining us uh, for the first time today. Uh, Designing for Empathy Summit and Workshop is curated and organized by one, Organization of Networks for Empathy. I am Elif Gökçidem, I use pronouns she, her, and I serve as the founder and president of one. One was just formed earlier this year as a small consulting firm to help shape our culture around empathy while positioning cultural institutions as incubators of empathy building through cross sectors collaboration and innovation. Designing for empathy is a unique transdisciplinary and cross sectors framework that creates a variety of platforms for individuals from different backgrounds, disciplines and sectors to come together and collectively develop solutions to the empathy deficit in our world. Uh, 
Designing for empathy uh, platforms include workshops that can be customized for institution, uh, our annual uh, Designing for Empathy Summit, which is in its fourth year this year, and uh, various publications. Uh, including, and if you have not uh, seen this yesterday, I shared with everyone uh, one of the latest um, uh, museum magazines from the AAM, American Alliance of Museums, uh, is entirely dedicated to empathy. And it is uh, almost a summary of the last summit, uh, our summit last year, because all the authors and the topics that were discussed are uh, also included in this uh, magazine. So if you don't have a copy, uh, it might be useful as a resource. Uh, we believe that our ability to develop uh, individuals' capacity for empathy towards the oneness of all beings, all of humanity, the environment, and our planet lies at the heart of our ability to solve our most complex problems. The challenges we face today, from social injustice to climate change, are not because we lack the intellectual capacity, the technologies, or the resources to tackle them but they are because caring for others as much as we care for ourselves, which makes us take action to solve another's suffering, requires a major perspective shift. This is where we stop seeing ourselves as the centers of the universe, but rather as integral parts of a whole, of which we are all a part. When we realize we are parts of a whole, we tend to calibrate and harmonize our attitudes, behaviors, and actions to preserve the harmony within this whole. This pragmatic perspective shift can only be achieved through a lived experience. And empathy, our ability to imagine the world through another's perspective, provides the foundation. And that's where designing for empathy comes in. We believe that because empathy can be best learned through lived experiences, creating those authentic experiences where individuals can discover, unlock, and advance their potential for empathy in safe and non-judgmental spaces become more essential. Designing for empathy provides a framework through which empathy and empathy building tools uh, are explored and developed for application in a variety of contexts, disciplines, and sectors. This framework, and with some guiding questions, was first uh, introduced uh, in a book that I edited uh, titled Designing for Empathy, Perspectives on the Museum Experience, which was published in 2019 by the American Alliance of Museums. Although our journey began in museums, we believe empathy should be a shared value worthy of collective strategy, um, intentional and international effort, and long-term investment across all sectors, businesses, and institutions in our society. And that's the topic of our first panel today. When we position our cultural institutions as incubators of empathy building, we can develop and present to our communities sustainable, effective, and most relevant and meaningful research evaluation-based learning experiences that foster empathy towards the interconnectedness and oneness of all of humanity and our planet. Next slide, please. Some of you may have may know that we started this journey uh, after the first book was published. Uh, we I received the invitation to uh, take a, a workshop and hold a workshop uh, hosted by the Tibet Museum and uh, the office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in India. And uh, and at that uh, amazing experience, which was almost like a week long uh, journey. Uh, and I don't know if our colleagues from uh, the Tibet Museum are here. I know that they were participating in the workshops and some of the earlier meetings. Uh, we're just so grateful for that experience and for their hospitality. Uh, one of the things that, that came out of that meeting was uh, three commitments. We decided each to convene every year for three days of collective learning, make at least one commitment each and turn it into action and pass it on. Meaning whatever inspires us here, whatever we may have learned, any ideas uh, or uh, inspirations, share it with someone else uh, that, who's not here. And, and with that, I also would like to invite you to set an intention for your uh, being here today. So that at the end of the summit, we can maybe go ahead and you know, review our, what were our intentions and what are some of the inspirations and the commitments and uh, share with our group. 
Oh, and then this is the, the moment actually, uh, I know that we did this yesterday, but today we have new people uh, coming up. Uh, and I really would like to take this opportunity for us to send a hello to um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I'm working on a report uh, to him, uh, uh, just uh, letting him know about our activities. And one of the things he said uh, at the end of our meeting was that, you know, I'm just one person and I have only two hands, so I need more hands to join in the in the fight for, you know, or in the, uh, you know, uh, expansion and you know uh, fostering of compassion and empathy and so the, the, he raised his hands like this so john wettenhall from the textile museum he suggested that we send him a photo of our group from you know the collectively at the end of the summit raising our hands and just to show him that you know we are working on it so if you don't mind please you know turning your cameras on for a group picture and, and I would appreciate it if those who can also can capture screen capture and share later on, because I think yesterday we only were able to capture one screen. So I'm gonna put myself on a gallery view. And I don't know if we have, yeah, we have two pages on my screen. So uh, Greg, are we ready? <laughs> sure, so <laughs> what we'll do is um, take a screen grab of this and then oh, we, do another yeah. screen. Okay, so we need to raise hands. Let, tell us when, now? <laughs> hey, Jesse. <Okay. laughs> and now one more. One more, keep it like that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And if we go, when we go back to our presentation, I would like to start our day with a, with a story um, which has some ties to India and into our summit. Um, We can go on to the next slide whenever uh, possible. Thank you. So this is a um, book illustration from one of my brother's books. Actually, this story itself is um, a book uh, uh, called uh, Masnavi, uh, which is uh, stories of wisdom as told by Mevlana Rumi and his friends. And my brother uh, turned this into a, a children's book and simplified it so that you know, some of the messages could be better understood. So in one of these stories, uh, uh, some tradespeople from India traveled to Turkey, then Anatolia, the Seljuk Empire. Uh, we're talking about like 11, 12 centuries. And uh, so no one in Anatolia has ever seen an elephant before. So the, the villagers were very, very curious. So what the Indian tradesman uh, tradesman did was to just you know put the elephant in a dark room in a in, in the caravansaray, and 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 let the villagers visit it one by one to to have this encounter with this mystical creature that they have never seen before, and uh, so you know the first person goes in you know he touches the the ear of the elephant and he says oh my gosh this is a this must be a beautiful tapestry or a carpet of some sorts. And then somebody touches the back of the elephant and he thinks that, oh, it must be a throne for a king, you know, so flat and stable and, you know, uh, sturdy. And somebody touches the leg of the elephant and he says, you know, oh, this surely must be a temple, like there's, we're talking about a building or something. So when they go out, they, they're all talking about, different things, you know, they say, oh, you know, like, no, it's a column, no, it's a temple, no, it's a carpet. Uh, and none of the uh, things that they share with each other really um, align. Uh, and, and the story is that they just needed some light in the room to be able to view the entire picture of the, of what an elephant is. And, uh, and we, uh, we did uh, start with uh, receiving some light from the wisdom of Rumi and Kabir Helminski yesterday. And we are continuing with uh, wisdom of light from uh, each one of you today and tomorrow. Uh, so empathy is a complex uh, topic. So it needs to be studied and uh, it's um, 
multiple dimensions. Uh, next visual, please. So in designing for empathy framework, we explore empathy within the context of our interconnectedness or oneness. We call this the oneness mindset. Uh, and uh, within this context, we ask three main questions. What is the object of your empathy? What are the alchemy of empathy ingredients that might be needed to create empathy in your institution or uh, place or in your life? And the scope and the spectrum of empathy, uh, its range of impact and potential outcomes. Because of our ability uh, or the barriers we face to perceive the whole that we are a part has tremendous practical implications in shaping our attitudes, thoughts, and behaviors within this whole. Empathy, our ability to imagine another's perspective, enables us to connect with our own humanness, this knowledge of oneself, what we are made of, our emotions, feelings, biases, and the qualities in our heart, enables us to recognize them in others and imagine that the other could be me. Through an understanding of ourselves and our ability to imagine the perspectives of another, we can then expand the circle of care and concern to all of humanity, the environment, the planet, and to our universe. Next slide, please. Kabir Helminski reminded, uh, reminded us yesterday that although most scientific literature or, on empathy might focus on demonstrable aspects of the human experience, such as in the brain, yes, we can see the effects of compassion and meditation on our brains, they lack to explain what that experience is. Empathy is one of those experiences that is quite complex. He reminded us that human beings operate on two realms, qualitative and quantitative. When we observe the Milky Way, we may see stars with our eyes and think that they might be made of you know, minerals and rocks. But what makes us feel awe and beauty towards that Milky Way is something that happens in our heart. Heart is where we perceive values and qualities such as empathy, beauty, compassion, unity, relationship, integrity, fairness, justice, peace, and love. He reminded us that love itself is that capacity that holds opposites in one place. And he left us with this question, what is the ecological purpose of a human being in this universe? And the answer that he got from another wise friend of his was the ecological function of a human being is love. Next slide, please. Just like the human experience itself, our experience of empathy also depends on internal and external qualities. The concept of the alchemy of empathy I tried to introduce in my book is an invitation for us to explore an experience of empathy, explore the experience of empathy through an identification and articulation of the qualities of that experience. I believe if we can articulate these qualities, we can also intentionally design for them. And some of the uh, qualities of empathy, the alchemy of empathy that were, that were included in the book uh, include intentionality, curiosity, play, collective journeying, vulnerability, uh, and hope. These qualities do not have sharp edges like a puzzle or borders. They are intrinsic to each other. Each holds the capacity of multiple qualities within. We often see them at work in groups of at least three of them together. This afternoon, we will explore several of these qualities as they are experienced in theater, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, or extended realities, tap dancing, and in the transdisciplinary artwork of Erika Blumenfeld, as she takes us on an exploration of our connections with and within the universe. I'm sure we will discover a few new ones during this process. You may have noticed that in our program, I included a template of some of these drops that are left blank. Please feel free to jot down any uh, inspiration or ideas and Perhaps we can share them later on with our community if we discover any new ones that we should collectively uh, explore further. These explorations of the comp complex nature of empathy allows us to better understand our own humanness and hopefully our innate capacity for love. They are also essential 
to develop the uh, most relevant and sustainable solutions for the empathy deficit in our world. One of the lessons learned from yesterday's panel discussion was that empathy building is a hands-on reiterative process. There are no toolkits that can, you, can, you can just uh, simply purchase off the shelf. Empathy requires intentionality, creativity, courage, collaboration, and long-term investment. Next slide, please. Also, it is important to consider how holistically are we looking at the symptoms of lack of empathy in our world? As we mentioned several times since yesterday, empathy lies at the heart of our solutions, most complex uh, problems, at the heart of all solutions to most complex problems that our humanity and the planet facing. Yet we either take it for granted or shy away from it because it feels too fluid in our rigidly compartmentalized way of looking at our world. One way or another, we seem to have failed to create those spaces that intentionally foster empathy towards our inter interconnectedness. In this context, in our upcoming panel, we will explore how businesses see empathy and how businesses, social entrepreneurship projects, governmental agencies, and museums see empathy. We will explore uh, some alignments and opportunities for collaboration. We will also explore this new idea of positioning empathy as a, as a cross sector shared value, worthy of collective strategy, intentional effort, and investment by all sectors, and the role of museums as incubators of empathy building experiences within this context. We will try to find some answers to the following questions. Solving empathy deficit requires a collective strategy and action in empathy building efforts. Museums, are museums as trusted institutions with research-based uh, approach and public access currently provide and have the capacity to develop new ones, uh, new solutions. How can we make empathy building initiatives in our cultural institutions sustainable? How can we customize and scale some of the existing amazing empathy building experiences that are available in our museums? some of which we have experienced in our workshops and make them available in different contexts. Can these experiences be used to augment ongoing equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts in many corporations and institutions? Can there be a collaboration opportunity here to co-develop new, relevant, and customized experiences? What would that look like? Joining me in this discussion, are C.T. Anderson, founder and creative director of Spring Clean, Ibrahim Ayub, social innovation designer and coach, Cinnamon Catlin Lagutko, director of Illinois State Museum and co-editor of Inclusive Museum Leader, Adib Mahmoud, managing director of FSG, Jim Wharton, director of conservation engagement and learning Seattle Aquarium, and Amy Wilson, Empathy for uh, author of Empathy for Change. Before we begin our discussion, uh, I and, and actually maybe we can just go ahead and transition into our panel. As we transition into our panel, um, I would like to share with you also that um, Adib Mahmoud, who uh, works for the organization, who coined the term shared value, uh, will help us better understand what shared value is so that we don't mistake in it for this you know, sentimental values of empathy that we should all share or anything like that. It has a more sort of business and, and profit oriented approach to empathy. And uh, so with that, I would like to invite our next panel. Elif, before we jump into the panel, let's do take a few minutes break um, to allow people to go get some water, have a cup of tea, and we'll be back with you in just about three minutes. Thank Perfect. you all. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. And now it is my pleasure to re-welcome Elif to introduce our, our panelists and get our conversation started. Yes, I uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you for taking the 
time. Uh, this is truly a courageous panel because <laughs> when I try to bring this group together, you know, I try to explain, you know, I have this idea of shared value and everybody just like that elephant, actually, I didn't do the good job in articulating what I was trying to do, but they, uh, they took a chance and they are here and I'm so grateful for your participation. Uh, and with that, I would love uh, to hear from uh, Adib uh, about the shared value initiative. Uh, as I mentioned, he works for F he's the managing director of FSG, uh, who coined the term shared value, and they have worldwide initiatives with major corporations. Um, and I think um, this knowledge will be very beneficial to uh, us nonprofits and uh, museums to uh, position ourselves within a you know slightly different framework or perhaps expand our uh, networks and framework uh, of you know how, where we can operate. Uh, thank you, Adib. You can take it from here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Elif. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides. Uh, hopefully, you all can see them. When um, Elif asked me to to join this panel, um, I was honored, and I'm honored to be here with all of you and to be here with all of the other panelists. Uh, and I I told I double checked with Elif and I asked her, do you really want me to be on this panel? Do you feel like I'll have something to add? The reason I asked that is, is it doesn't have anything to do with my belief in how important empathy is, but it had to do with the fact that we actually don't explicitly talk about empathy a lot in our work. Um, now, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more context about FSG. We, we, all of our work is in service of equitable systems change and social change. So we work on issues of health equity, racial justice, climate change, um, workforce mobility. Uh, as you might imagine, empathy is important to all of these issues. Yet at the same time, um, we're not always explicitly talking about empathy. And I would say in our work with corporations, which is where I spend a lot of my time, uh, it shows up even less. Uh, but I think that it can be a very powerful concept and idea and tool for companies to also achieve what they're trying to achieve. So in terms of context, let me just share a little bit more about FSG so you know where I'm coming from. The organization that I work at, we are a 20-year-old organization. We were started by Michael Porter, who teaches at Harvard Business School, and Mark Kramer. And we were started as Foundation Strategy Group. That's where the acronym comes from. We were started by Michael and Mark as an organization that would bring strategy consulting to foundations. And we continue to work with uh, many of the, the both largest well-known and some of some smaller family foundations today. So foundations like Gates, Ford, Rockefeller, Hewlett, Packard, uh, but also a lot of community and family foundations. But today, a big portion of our work is with large for-profit companies. Uh, and, and we believe that companies can be a powerful engine of, again, equitable systems change, with it, which is our mission. Um, we do most of our work through consulting, but we also do quite a bit of writing. So this concept of shared value that Michael and Mark first wrote about came out in Harvard Business Review back in 2011. And you see screenshots here on the bottom left um, of, the, of the original article. And then a year later in 2012, we uh, uh, incubated and launched the Shared Value Initiative. So the Shared Value Initiative is part of FSG and that exists to spread the practice of the concept of shared value all around the world. And so those are the three ways in which FSG engages. It's engaging one-on-one -on -one with companies and foundations in consulting, it's writing and, and participating in, in conversations like this, and it's through our initiatives. And um, we are a nonprofit organization ourselves, and we engage in these multiple ways um, so that we can also continue to refine and and, and, and modify our own thinking. So we have some strong points of view about concepts like shared value, but we're not always right. And we're not always thinking of all of the different angles. Um, one of the limitations of shared value that, that we I don't think we thought broadly enough about this is that the original article had very little mention of issues of equity uh, and issues of, of structural bias and, and racism. And that is something that uh, we recognize and we are actively working on today to think about what is the role of shared value in addressing issues of, of equity and, and, and thinking about those who are most marginalized. Here's a quick um, snapshot of some of the companies that we work with. As you can see, the work is quite diverse in terms of issue areas, in terms of types of companies uh, and different industries. 
one of the trends that has shaped our work with companies is the fact that there is a lot of demand from stakeholders, especially over the last few years, for corporations, major corporations to be purpose-led. And when mainstream investors like BlackRock and CEOs uh, of investing companies like Larry Fink, Fink at BlackRock or CEOs of major companies are talking about purpose, then everyone takes notice, right? And BlackRock and Larry um, have been very vocal consistently over the last few years saying that companies, uh, if they're going to add value to society, they have to have this sense of purpose. And because a, a mainstream investor like BlackRock is saying it, uh, many companies are now thinking about, well, what does it mean for us to be purpose-led? And this is not coming just from investors. We know that employees don't want just a paycheck. They want a, uh, to, to be working at a company that is driven by purpose. And other stakeholders are demanding companies to be purpose-led as well. So at FSG, we think of a company's purpose as the reason for being that simultaneously helps solve a social problem and creates significant financial value for the company. And I wanna highlight that part again. It's about simultaneously helping to solve societal challenges while creating value for the company. And when I talk about shared value, you'll see that this is very much aligned to how, we, how Michael and Mark originally defined and conceptualized shared value. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide but we do think that there are a few different characteristics for what a purpose worth having is. We think that a corporate purpose that's worth having has to be significant, has to be authentic to the company. It has to be profitable because the company has to make money from it. And the company has to be serious about it. There has to be accountability about it. And when we think about um, what a company does, there are all of these different ways that major companies today uh, operate, right? There's obviously the, their products and services that's at the core of what a company does, but they're the norms that shape a, a company. They engage in government relations. They work with their suppliers and their distributors. Employee engagement is a big part of the work as is CSR and corporate philanthropy. We think that shared value, which I'm going to get to in a minute, is one of the most important ways that a company can achieve its purpose at scale. Not the only way, but a, a very important way. So this concept of shared value that Elif has mentioned, um, I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this. The way Michael and Mark in the 2011 article defined shared value is it's about practices and policies within companies that enhance the competitiveness of a company while simulta simultaneously advising, advancing social and environmental issues. And at the heart of shared value is this cycle, this virtuous cycle that we have on the left. When a company identifies a social need and, and it's able to see how helping to solve that need actually makes them more competitive, that that's the top part of the cycle, then the company is incentivized to, to spend more resources in trying to solve that social problem. They put their best people on it. They invest more money in it. They, they bring all of their assets, not just people and money, but the, the, the power of a large company to try to solve that problem which in turn helps advance that uh, progress towards that social problem, which in turn then um, incentivizes the company to, to invest even more. That is at the heart of shared value. When shared value works best, this cycle is self-fulfilling and, and strengthening itself. Often where shared value breaks apart is the top part of that cycle where companies identify social issues that they're working on, but they haven't really built the business case the financial model for why solving that problem actually helps their bottom line or top line or both. A couple of things that we, we feel shared value is not. Uh, and this is what you were alluding to earlier, Elif. You know, we haven't copyrighted this term. People can use this term the way we want. But when, when Elif and I first spoke, I, I mentioned to Elif that, hey, Elif, you might be using it in a slightly different way than how we've talked about it. So when we talk about shared value, it is purely a business strategy. Now, I mentioned to you all that we're a nonprofit, we care about social impact. We think that when companies are motivated by their commercial interests, they can actually create more impact. That is why this idea is about being a, a business strategy. So it's not about philanthropy. It's also not about, uh, uh, about us saying philanthropy is anyway 
less important. It's just different. Philanthropy is, is engaging in a different way than shared value, which is thinking about the, 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 the profit motivations of the company. It's also not about personal values. And so this is where the, the, the S, uh, the plural comes in. Uh, personal values are very important. You know, personal values of empathy or other values that we have, they drive companies because companies is, are made up of people. But it's, it's not about um, trying to, to survey a company or its stakeholders or trying to balance stakeholder interests of simply demanding to, to stakeholders or saying, because the CEO has this value, we must do this. It's about a holistic business strategy that, that a company is trying to pursue. So with that, I just wanted to share one quick example of a medical device company, Becton Dickinson. And in the late 80s, Becton Dickinson realized that our healthcare workers who were protecting us were being injured from uh, the lack of safety syringes, which are now uh, uh, all around us. We, we recognize that to be a, a common device, didn't exist back in the, the late 80s. And so BD saw a social challenge that the people who were meant to protect us, those very people were getting injured from safety syringes. They were getting in, in, in infected by HIV and other diseases because of the, their lack of safety devices. And so they saw a business opportunity here. They invested R&D dollars. They worked with some of their strongest critics to develop a data surveillance system. They worked with the Nurses Association. And they also engaged in advocacy efforts with, which led in 2000 to President Clinton signing um, into, into law the, the Needle Stick Safety and, and Prevention Act. And as a result of their investment in safety syringes, this product portfolio has, has grown from 5 million to over 2 billion for BD. It's their biggest source of revenue. And Sharp's injuries have dropped by over 50% uh, by some studies. So it's a great example of how a company has been able to seize a social challenge as a business opportunity help save thousands of lives and have created a, a market positioning for themselves. So, I, you know, I was curious and I just Googled shared value and empathy. And there are some studies that come up um, that talk about shared value and empathy together. But as I mentioned at, at the beginning, um, I don't think there's enough of this happening. Um, I don't think companies are talking about empathy. And I think the, one of the reasons is because empathy is, is thought of as something that might be soft or that might be fluffy. I think we have an opportunity to change that. And I think there are multiple opportunities for us to demonstrate why empathy is important for the private sector. Um, if you're looking for customer insights, you need to understand where that customer is coming from, especially when you're talking about underserved population. What has been their experience and their journey that can help you innovate and create new products? The intersection of business opportunities and social challenge. If you're trying to understand a, 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 a new area, whether it's climate change or workforce mobility, I think empathy is important to understand those new issues that companies are trying to do right now. If you're trying to create a new experience for your employees and trying to increase employee engagement and loyalty, I think becoming an employer of choice, it's critical for companies to be empathetic towards their employees. I think it goes without saying that it's very difficult, if not impossible, for a company to engage in diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, if there, if empathy is not there as a, as as an important part of their work, and then finally, in in engaging in corporate responsibility and philanthropy, again, I think empathy um, should be a critical part of how they engage. So um, I'm going to stop there, and hopefully that gives us a good starting off point, and really looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts. Thank you so much, Adib. That was um, quite informational. Thank you, um, and and I, I and, and and I hope inspirational because that's why we are here. You know, we don't have a prescription yet, and as you said, uh, empathy comes up as uh, something that we use or should be used, but it is not often you know positioned as a product. <clears throat> excuse me, a product that the cultural institutions can deliver to society. Uh, which could be an investment opportunity for others because then they can use that product for, for the very reasons that you just listed on your last slide. Uh, literally all of them apply if empathy is positioned as a product. And, and there are several issues of course uh, could be you know, um, mentioned about positioning empathy as a product because 
you know, where do you get that from? Where do you get empathy or empathy building experiences from? And, and I believe that uh, museums, uh, especially because they are hands-on experiential learning places and they have this context that, that they uh, can present, you know, the rich context that they can bring to, the, to any experience that can help take individuals away from their daily routines, literally. So it, it is not a, like a, a corporate, uh, uh, you know, training that everybody has to go through just to make sure that, you know, it's checked on their uh, personal record, but they actually can engage it uh, in the office, outside the office, as a family, as, uh, as intergenerational, uh, you know, dialogue. So it, this also represents, you know, um, uh, community building, uh, community healing efforts. Uh, so there are ripple effects. And, and of course, there's this, uh, uh, Re, you know, in, inquiry or the request by the shared value concept as that uh, this needs to be quantifiable, right? I mean, how do we show impact? How, is it like how many injuries we healed? <laughs> how many broken hearts have we healed? Can we quantify that? Or how many traumas, you know, we have healed? That's very hard to quantify. But there are ways, other ways to quantify that while not completely leaving those out. Because I mean, this uh, summit, and, and I hope uh, those who were not here yesterday will get a chance and will take the time to uh, watch the first day, uh, because it really reinforced my belief that you know we really need to find ways to combine our qualitative and quantitative uh, existences in this world. And I'm probably talking about like a thirty thousand feet view level, but. Uh, it happens if we do it, you know, it's just a choice. It's how we look at it. And if we choose to do it that way, we may be able to find ways to do it, you know? So, and that's what I'm hoping that we will explore. Uh, and I'm, I don't have a, like a set of questions to each individual. Uh, and, um, but I would like to actually, um, if I may, let's start with CT uh, because she's a, a Nonprofit, you know, sort of social uh, with a social entrepreneurship angle, uh, uh, a, a, corp a business, I think, right? Spring Clean is a business or a nonprofit, uh, but it, it does have this environmental mindset. And, and uh, I would love to hear from you. How do you see in your work uh, uh, and, and in your professional work, if you are allowed to share, uh, how do you see uh, empathy? Yeah. Um... Adib actually stole all my talking points, so we'll see if I can say something that others will find of value here. Sorry. Um, that's all good, all good. I can't wait to talk to you more about it. Um, I've worked in some form of environmental, social, or governance issues my entire 20 plus year career um, before ESG was coined ESG. I think at that time it was called corporate responsibility or corporate social responsibility. I studied Michael Porter's work in grad school when he was launched the initiative for a competitive inner city. So it's all coming full circle for me. The funny thing is, is that empathy is not ever called out. <laughs> and so that's a key point to note. Folks that are, that lead with their heart, if I can say that, understand this work that is why we do what we do across all the various different um, sectors and industries, but we don't tie it together with the word like empathy. And so actually when you first asked me to join and I saw these folks who work in museums, I was like, I don't think I'm qualified even to be on this panel, but it all makes sense now because I literally have dedicated my entire career to this work. Um, Spring Clean got started because I was working for another corporation at the time, uh, a major retailer on environmental sustainability. And we started um, a program for reusable bags. That was, you know, when reusable bags weren't yet a thing. And I am a self-proclaimed fashionista. So I have a lot of luxury and designer bags. Um, and all of a sudden there was like this conflict and I was like, wait a minute, all these things that I'm learning about greenhouse gas emissions and human and labor rights, and yet I'm supporting these industries. And so I hadn't yet figured out how to align what I did every day with my everyday purchases. And so that's why Spring Clean got started, because I still want to be a fashionista. I still want to wear cute stuff, but I don't want to have a negative impact to the people 
the resources, the animals of our planet. So that's how the organization started. So I work on this in my nine to five and also five to nine. Um, so that was a long way of saying that Spring Clean got started based on everything that you're talking about. And our mission is to educate people on the circular economy, on sustainable consumption, and to take value out of things that have been thrown away or would be thrown away, like textile materials, and move them through supply chain so that they have a second life. That's not the long-term solution. That's just the interim solution. The long-term solution is that I'd be able to go to a store, you'd be able to go to a store and ask your retailer for something that was built with the circular economy me in mind. So if I buy another shawl like this, I know that it has a second life when I buy it and I know where to send it. Um, so I've created a, a long-term, um, what's the word, retirement strategy for myself because it's a very, <laughs> uh, it's a very complex problem. Um, I feel like I'm getting excited, so I'll pause there. <laughs> Leaf, could I, is it okay? I'd love to ask a question of, I'd love to ask a question of Adib and, and CT. So when I hear UCTs talk about circular economy and your passion for this work and Adib, and, and I hear it's sort of the genuine investment in, in this work. And then I also think about uh, companies who get accused of greenwashing, right? And who, when you, when you tie something like empathy or like environmentalism to a, a, a for-profit cause, how do you counsel businesses to deal with the cynicism that comes along with, with, with that juxtaposition? Um, I, I'll start with these. Um, I think that authenticity, first of all, for mo those of us who work in major corporations or lead major corporations, whether they're for profit or nonprofit, understand that if it's, that if it's not authentic, it won't last anyway. And number two, if it doesn't offer value to the company, how are you going to talk about it? <laughs> so you have to, you have to, you have those two work together. And so I can share with you, most of them, I've worked for many Fortune 500 companies. We don't start talking about sustainability just because it'll sound good for the PR and communications team. That's just not, that's not a thing. Um, and when it is, it's really, it's sussed out very quickly. Um, I think what you're starting to see now, especially with the lead up to the major climate summit next week, is that those that are just talking to just be heard or be a part of the conversation and those that are serious, they'll start to, they'll start to be a, a divergent. Um, and so I've been fortunate enough to work for companies who are serious about it and I understand how long it takes to get that stuff out there. Um, but companies across financial industries, retailers, all of those are starting to think about those greenwashing claims because we're in 2021, <laughs> the science tells us that we have until 2050 and we need to do some major, major changes by 2030. So anybody that is in business understands the business imperative. So it starts with authenticity. Yeah, I agree hundred percent, Jim. You saw that I went through that a little quickly, but the, we ha I had four characteristics about what it means for a company to have a have a purpose worth having. And, and one of them is, is if it's authentic or not. I mean, very few people would question whether Patagonia is authentic in that company's desire to save the planet, right? Like you might remember the don't buy this jacket campaign. So everything that the company does is geared towards, you know, how do we, how do we protect, help protect our planet while still being a profitable, um, sus sustainable company? Unfortunately, I think greenwashing still happens. We do try to be very careful. First of all, we aren't, specifically FSG is not a, communications firm. So we don't have that expertise anyway to, to do the communications work. We're, we're strategy consultants. But on top of that, we, we do try to see whether that authenticity is there within individuals who we'll be working with when we're taking on new clients. I also think that you know NGOs, consumers, employees, other stakeholders have gotten more sophisticated, especially with social media, in terms of being able to assess which companies need it and which are doing it for, for just the PR reasons. Thank you. Thank you. This was, this was very helpful to put things in context. Uh, and Amy, uh, may I ask you how you see from your uh, perspective, uh, I know that you work with uh, the government and even the White House. And, um, and as you know, it was you know, one of the mottos of the Biden uh, uh, acceptance speech, right? Empathy was mm -hmm. there on the stage, you know, literally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And while, you know, my first reaction was like, yeah, you know, take pictures of TV and send it to friends and all that. But then, you know, 
<laughs> the reality sinks in and you know yeah. in yeah. some decisions are very hard and uh, mm -hmm. but i mean can we really approach to government institutions or the politicians with empathy well, I think I think the world that we're living in right now is is um, you know what I bring up in my book um, called, is called VUCA, which is stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Stands for yep. There's my book. See, <laughs> I was like, I'll put my book up too. Woo! Plug, plug. Um, <laughs> here's a plug for the book. Um, and and you you mentioned that um, you know when Biden took office and his acceptance speech. Like I was finishing my book, I was going to launch it during the election. And then I was like, oh, it seems like a lot going on right now. And I actually ended up launching it um, about a couple of days after the inauguration. Um, and so it's, it's, it was an interesting um, time to be launching this because yes, to, to your point, um, we have, I have this like overwhelming excitement to see that the leader of the United States is talking about empathy, but also seeing a disconnect with what the world is, is happening in the world. For example, in the midst of me getting ready for my book launch, you know, the insurrection happened. Right. And, and so I was like, it was like, this seems like disjointed. I was like, this doesn't seem very empathetic on how, how we're doing this. And it's just like going deeper into the divides that we have. I hold a whole chapter on seek first to understand, then, um, then, then be understood. And I think so often we have been put in the situation um, in a lot of ways, technology has shifted us in this way. It's not a surprise right now that Facebook, um, Apple, you know, Google, uh, um, the internet is on trial right now, right? And we're trying to think about how has that shifted our our um, our world and our society? And it is it is not always for the best, right? So I think we have this very complex world that we live in, and um, and we have to take that to account. And um, I mean, this past year has definitely shown that <laughs> with the pandemic, as we work forward, um, as we go forward. And I wanted to address um, Kirsten. I think a couple people in the in the the chat here were talking about you know, and we're talking about how design thinking um, or DT or also called, used synonymously sometimes with human-centered design is um, has empathy at the beginning of it. Um, uh, one of the things I mention in my book is that we have to um, kind of, uh, first of all, everybody is a designer. I, I personally believe that, that now in this today's society, we have to kind of understand what the problems are in the world and then have build the power within ourselves to be that change and to be a change agent in the world and actually take that agency and move with it. Um, and, and so that involves having our own power, understanding our own needs and beliefs, but then actually putting them into action. And so that's why the book is called Empathy for Change. Um, and um, I'll have a whole chapter on the evolution of design. Um, uh, there's four major points I put in there, but one that I think is really relevant to the, the conversation that's happening in the chat is that in innovation, we often think of this trifecta. Um, if you read Human Centered Design um, by IDEO, um, you will see this right at the beginning of the book. It's um, uh, three concentric circles, you know, a Venn diagram. One talks about desirability. Do people want what we're having, right? Do, is this the, does the world, like, do people, do users need this, right? Number two is feasibility, right? Can we actually do this in the world? And number three is often viability. And that is often thought of, this all comes from like Silicon Valley thinking and human centered design and design thinking. This is often thought about is like, am I going to be able to make money and sustain myself on that? So when I think about shared value with what Adib was talking about, I think that there is a missing link there. And so I say, instead of us having viability, we need to think about, is this a necessary thing that should exist in the world today? And so I cross out viability and put necessary. Um, so there's all things like, what is the environmental impact? What's the social impact? Um, what are the many things that come into, into play when we're creating a new thing in the world or changing something up? 
Um, and then to kind of bring this all together, to, to talk about the work is so often we talk, we have, we have the right intention, right? We had um, assume positive intent, we often say, especially when we're brainstorming or building something in the world, that is no longer enough. We have to both set the right intention, but also own the impact. And if we don't own the impact, then that is that is not that is not going to make the world better in any <laughs> any form or fashion. So I'll cede the time for other people, but I'll just drop some bombs and move on. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Thank you, Amy. Thank you. That was wonderful. I'm just gonna finish my. Um, uh, that was awesome. And and um, so what I've, I'm hearing so far is that you know um, after Adib's presentation, you know CT mentioned about you know authenticity, and and I think the whole um, uh, sort of premise of you know CT's work and this creating this behavior change in a way, right? And not only it is an empathetic action just to build this business. But also maybe the running, running the existence of that business also depends of, on how empathetic people are, so that they, you know, choose to make that uh, difference, you know, or uh, change in their lives. Uh, and then uh, we talked about, you know, the the greenwashing and cynicism and how to counter that with authenticity. Uh, and um, and Amy uh, touched upon, you know, the design thinking and. And empathy is at the heart of the design thinking. And, and Ibrahim uh, is also uh, working in you know, uh, this design strategy, uh, design thinking, and, and coaching. Uh, I, and it is really interesting to me that you know, in the you know, groups like you know, IDEO and design thinking communities, yes, they are, I think, religiously following those uh, criteria that they have created for themselves. And they just use empathy as, as a as a tool, just like any other tool. Uh, but I, I would think that, like as designers, they they should know better to not to take it for granted. I think they almost assume that people come to the table with empathy, like plenty of empathy, to Im immediately understand uh, what that means and how to, that could translate into you know user experience and all that. And uh, maybe for designers, it comes, you know, it, you can learn because you're practicing at it. But how do you actually design for empathy instead of using it as a step in the design, which is at the heart of the design process? How do you design for empathy? Can you use the design thinking to design for empathy? And, and one of the design thinking steps includes, you know, bringing uh, diverse perspectives around the table, which is like uh, what we are doing now. But what other elements could there be? And we are, I think at this point, we are talking about, uh, you know, social transformation design, <laughs> not just individual behavior change. And we are talking about how can we position our institutions? What other, what, uh, what kind of players do we need around the table to explore this idea a little bit further? Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think one thing, and you know, we talked about with with the design thinking steps that you know we first empathize and then kind of go across the steps, but having to take a step back and and saying, in, in one sense, you know, we want empathy to be part of the process, but it's not. You don't. You never finish, I guess, empathizing. And I think sometimes the danger with some of the design work is when we you know, feel like we have a sense of understanding what people want, then we kind of move forward. But then, and also to Amy's point too, that we don't think about what is the downstream impact of it. So, so one thing, a lot of the consulting I was doing in the past was that we really try to stay away from even thinking about people as users, because then you kind of confine that person to just how they're interacting with your product. But now the more and more that technology and everything and the way society is connected, that there's no silos so anything that we produce or uh, create uh, whether products or services there's going to be some type of other impact so think less about you know how does this affect how does it impact the person using our product versus how does it impact the person as a human and then with their relationship with kind of the people around them um so that's that's going to be one element and, and for us so i did quite a bit um around cultural ethnography and i think that's helped a lot around with the design work in that you know looking at just st strictly from a design perspective that 
you have this empathy of trying to understand people of interviews and, and kind of questions and things like that. We sometimes there is a danger where you we basically we we understand we see what their behaviors are, but then we match it to our own kind of value set and mental model versus just taking it basically putting a blank canvas and say, I'm trying to understand the mental model that you have. And then why then based off of that, you made, you know, certain decisions or certain behaviors, because this is kind of the, the house or, you know, the model in which you're, you kind of see the world. Um, so I think that that's kind of a, a pre-step, which I think sometimes is missed in the, in the design space. Um, and then to your, to your point around kind of the people that are needed uh, around the table, I think, you know, one obviously is the, is the people that are being impacted directly, but then kind of who are the people one layer, two layers outside of that? So I can give a couple examples was one where we were working with a nonprofit that um, basically that provided um, uh, law services for victims of gender-based crimes. So we were doing quite a few interviews with, you know, with people who were uh, impacted by this, as well as prosecutors, uh, medical professionals, um, policymakers, and, and, and all that. But then kind of even going a further step to say the people who are on the other side of hotlines, of that they had, you know, these um, hotlines for domestic violence, and then what is their kind of experience? So we, we went and visited some of those um, offices, and they had to have kind of separate rooms with you know, pictures of like dogs and sun and like make it very bright because you know it's like 12 hour shifts of, of hearing really horrific stories um and then so having to think about you know of course we were trying to make the website and, and the digital presence as streamlined as possible to make make sure that people are getting the services that they need but then how do we also make sure that we're addressing the needs of of the service providers themselves as well um so i think that's that's one element where you know empathy really is the driver in that in, in that sense, but it's it's taking, you know, taking a step back and then trying to take three or four more steps back and then looking forward in the future as well to see what is kind of the implication of, of what we're offering now is that, because in one sense, if we're now gonna make it much easier for people to um, get those services, which is great, but then how does that then impact the people who are kind of processing those requests and thinking about kind of that whole ecosystem. So I think, you know, kind of bring it together. I think, you know, if we're using design, design thinking and, and trying to operate with empathy is great, but then there has to be a layer of that cultural ethnography and understanding kind of how the person operates. And then this idea of systems thinking as well, where, you know, every product service, basically every interaction is in a set of, kind of systems. And if we, the more we can understand what those layers are, uh, I think the more we can have a, a more clear picture around what we're doing and the potential impact that, that we may be having. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Ibrahim. That's that's really wonderful information, and um, yeah, it is you know empathy and you know the design thinking process. You know there there should be a pre step, and then you know the the continuation of it, right? You know how do you uh, make sure that I mean you have a responsibility to uh, for that impact, which is what also Amy said, right? On the impact, and um, and I would like to ask uh, Cinnamon. Uh, for her perspectives and in um, as, as a museum leader, uh, but now with a slightly changed position working for the, I think, uh, quasi governmental institution because state history museum right and 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 what are some of the dynamics you see in your everyday life, you know, how does empathy look to you, how do you feel it does it, I mean, how, how is it relevant to you and. Um, and it is becoming clear to me that, you know, like there is a need for empathy development, you know, this sort of like, we need to create a system for fostering empathy. Uh, and, and we need to take into account all the, the ideas that were shared in terms of like intention, impact, authenticity. Um, but uh, when dealing with multiple stakeholders as a museum, how does that look like in your, I mean, in your uh, area? Yes, so I am with the Illinois State Museum now, which is wholly state government, part of a state agency. We do benefit from the nonprofit sector with a friends group, but for all intents and purposes, we are a state government. Um, prior to my time here, I've just been here over two years, I was working for a private nonprofit museum, a lot more independence, a lot more vulnerability to the ebb and flows of the market than I have with state government. 
Um, and to just kind of address that first part of how is empathy relevant to me as a museum leader, um, I think it aligns with my commitment and practice around inclusion. I don't feel that you can think inclusively, work inclusively without a heart-centered mindset, a people-first attitude. Um, of course, within that is empathy, but I will say that in leadership, the way that I was trained, the way that I see my colleagues operate, the emotionality of that, the, um, the authentic person, the whole person is not something you're trained to keep with you. Um, and that of course aligns with a lot of corporate leadership models. And the museum field started borrowing from corporate models um, about 20 years ago. And it quite frankly, hasn't served them well because museums need to be responsive to their audiences. And museums at the same time, there's an incredible tension around the fact that we are masterful at informal learning. It's a place for free choice learning. We set the stage, you come in and interact, but we are infamous for being exclusive about our audiences, not being um, reflective of our communities, not being mindful of societal needs and changing mission, purpose, direction to respond to societal needs. There are wonderful examples in the field, but by and large, the museum field has not been adept at this. And there's a great deal of criticism out there. Um, and I experience it as well because I came into an institution that really hadn't connected with community. Um, so to walk into that experience um, and to see the impact is startling and it challenges my skill sets daily. Um, I certainly know that leading through inclusion, leading with a commitment to the whole person is, is the way it's going to be for me as a leader, but my hopes for connecting in community is a longer play out because this institution has been around since 1877. That's a long time to make up for um, in responding to societal needs for the state of Illinois as a state entity. The other challenge to this, um, and I think it's important to name, is that museums as a whole were built as part of the colonial enterprise. Um, they are colonizing forces in that they have scooped up the treasures of others and they have deemed them important on pedestals and have been part of the message making around oppression. Um, and even though a museum today may open with absolutely different intentions, they still have a mold they're slipping into that's built that way. So to the audience, to the people, um, to the place, it looks the same. And I don't think a museum leader, a museum itself can move into an empathetic space until they acknowledge that and give voice to that in all of the learning spaces that they provide um, at the same time, truly engaging in community. I'm not sure um, leadership in the museum field is fully ready for that. Um, I know that we talk about it a lot, but museums are chronically, not a but, I should say an and, museums are chronically underfunded, chronically um, spread thin, and museum leaders are expected to deliver um, magic and wow at all times. And that gives them no space to be vulnerable. And that's at the heart of this, right? Uh, to tap into your emotionality at work, you've got to be vulnerable. Um, you have to be vulnerable and not be um, uh, punished for it by your board. Um, you have to be vulnerable and not be punished for it by state government, whatever it means. It's a high risk proposition and not a lot of directors will move into that space. Um, I foolishly have over and over again and learned that um, I <laughs> have a lot to learn. And with that, you know, when you move into that place of vulnerability, um, you're going to challenge your identity, of course. You're going to cede power and authority, um, but you're certainly going to be committing to daily work. And this is something I say a lot to folks is that, um, especially if you operate um, as a white person in a traditional position of power, um, it's a lifetime of coding that told me what I can get when I can get it and my privilege. And it's a lifetime of decoding that. So if I think as a leader and I'm trying to orchestrate change and I'm trying to connect and respond to societal notions that I can suddenly take a class and have that all figured out is a whole new level of harm that I get to perpetrate as a white person. 
Um, so it's daily work. And I think directors also don't afford that time um, because they set the tone for their institutions and how they operate in their communities. Um, so I have a lot more to say there. I'll pause and uh, pass it to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Cinnamon. Thank you for your heartfelt sharing. Uh, really. Uh, and and, and I, I would like to also give an opportunity to Jim. Uh, and, and I would love to hear from, uh, from Jim's perspective, because I think he's also experiencing this. But also Micah mentioned yesterday, Micah Parson from the Museum of Us, this inside out process. Then we talked about empathy uh, or empathy building in our institutions. Uh, immediately it becomes the internal sort of uh, reflection, reflective process. And, and what are some of the things that we can do? Uh, and, and, uh, but, uh, and, and it sounds like, you know, some institutions perhaps are, might be slightly better equipped or positioned to do that, but some maybe come with much heavier baggage, so to speak, to even propose something like that because it requires vulnerability and it can just turn the table upside down instantly causing more harm. Uh, so uh, Jim, you know, how is this playing out at the Seattle Aquarium? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think I, I keep hearkening back and thinking of the conversation yesterday about, I can't remember if it was rephrased as um, intermixing or, or holding things that are different together as part of a whole. And I, I think if there's a nit that sometimes get picked with empathy is that it, it privileges similarity. So it, we, when we think about empathy, we think about how is this other similar to me? And I think there's a danger in that in washing out the differences. And while we do want to feel like one community, we also are different. And those differences are important. Uh, and, they're, and the fact that they're, they're core to identity, people don't want you to see through that, right? Colorblind is something we need to leave behind. And so I, I think using empathy in the, in the context, especially around DEI, is really important. And it's, it's nuanced and, and needs, to be, needs to be careful and intentional and, and, uh, and really sort of picked apart. And, and I think when we, when we, we're obviously um, a little different than, say, a quote unquote museum. Uh, we have live animals. Uh, we want people to empathize with those animals, and it's sort of a, a similar problem in that we want them to, we want them to empathize with an animal, but recognize that it's not the same as just imagining that animal is a person, right? That an animal has very different life, has a very different life, has very different needs, and and you know, there's so there's a lot of these these sort of parallels about how do you how do you empathize without just sort of mushing it all together. Um, being able to keep those those separate, and I, I think the way that we're doing it, you know, strategic for our purpose, which is is for conservation, is to is to tease apart sort of the the skills that are involved with empathy. So we talk about when we we do workshops with other institutions, we talk about the specific practices that help engendering empathy for animals, and those specific practices are valuable to people in and of themselves, because sometimes I think sometimes empathy has kind of amb an ambiguous quality to it, right? When, when you talk with people about being more empathetic, they go, yeah, like, you, like sounds like you're asking them to be nice. Like you should be more, of course I should be nice. I should be empathetic. Of course I am. And yet it's not always operationalized for people. People, I don't know that everybody knows how to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to the earlier conversation about design thinking and that sometimes designers just set, assume that the end user is similar to them and, and has the same sort of needs. And so that, that whole old phrase, walk a mile in a person's shoes or swim a mile in a, in a fish's fins, it, it, that doesn't really work if you are just putting yourself in that situation and assume that you're going to react to those things in, this, in the way that you would, as opposed to the way that they would. It reminds me of the whole golden versus platinum rule, right? You treat, treat others as you would like to be treated or treat others as they would like to be treated. So it's, I think if we can break it down into the individual skills, so like utilizing your imagination, um, learning about that knowledge, that culture, that animal, uh, having rich sensory experiences, like these, the pieces to the puzzle, I think, which are individually valuable to people, I think people can respond to and, and grab a hold of that a little more easily and start to practice. And since we, we talk about empathy as a skill, practice is the key. If you're going to become more empathetic, you need to practice. Maybe a zoo and an aquarium or a museum is the best place to do that, or, or at least one place to do that. And 
And that's probably good because I, I don't know where else you're getting those opportunities, right? It's not really, it's not really happening at work, probably. It's it's not happening at school. It's not happening in the places we would hope that it would. So why not a zoo or aquarium or a museum um, as a place where people can come and practice, practice their empathetic muscles? Exactly. And and with that, you know, I would like to ask you a follow-up question. And because I know that you have these uh, modules of learning. Uh, and, and we have been you know, experimenting with them. I was lucky to be a part of some of the creative design process or reiteration. And, uh, and, I, and I find them highly you know, relevant to, to be honest, any corporation. And, and as a matter of fact, it is, I think it is better if these empathy exercises are somewhat um, unrelated to what they're experiencing in their day-to-day -day life, you know, because I think that helps people to open up and be more vulnerable. It puts people in a playful mode rather mm -hmm. than being put on the spot mm -hmm. to be in a certain way, empathetic versus not. So, um, but just really like, you know, look at some animals and uh, judge yourself, you know, your own perception in a safe and playful way uh, to discover about yourself how you look at the world, you know, why do I find, uh, you know, a, a dolphin more, uh, you know, I can empathize with a dolphin more than a, a sea urchin or, you know, and, and barnacles do not even come to picture right. <laughs> and, uh, and, or, or maybe sea otter, right? Like you have this famous sea otter that everybody loves, you know, and it's quite a character. Uh, but then there are other components and, and uh, I think that those are the experiences, those are like tiny little subtle perspective shifting uh, practices, just like you said, are quite applicable in life, I think. And, and um, so the, the question is, can we customize, you know, like, and, and I know that we can, you can, but uh, you know, what are some of the other players that you may need around the table to expand your offerings to other contexts, yeah. you know, other but, corporations, perhaps. Yeah, I think we learn best when we're a little bit out of our context, right? Out of our comfort zone. It's why I like this summit so much is because it's not full of zoo and aquarium folks. Uh, it's incredibly diverse. And I'm hearing, you know, I'm, I'm hearing from museum peers, I'm hearing from folks in the business community. And so it's it's easier that that that's more of a spur for learning and change for me. And, you know, animals animals are a pretty, can be a pretty safe space for people to practice their empathy because it's thankfully the neural pathways for developing empathy for animals are the same as those for developing with people. And so if it's easier for you to come and, and practice with an otter uh, or a barnacle, I'm, I'm partial to barnacles. I think dolphins are mean. Uh, so I think if you, you, an animal is a place where people feel drawn to them, they can practice those skills. And the thing that I love that happens in our workshops is that People start the day, and so when we do workshops with zoos and aquariums, there's often deep skepticism about whether empathy is the right tool for conservation, and especially is it the right tool for zoos and aquariums? Because some, especially animal care specialists, will feel that, well, we're, you're training, you're training animal activists, you're training for people. You're, you're if they're too empathetic with the animals, then they won't want to see them in zoos and aquariums. Well, I've seen people with those thoughts at the beginning of the workshop. By the end of the workshop asking questions about what well, it, it, it happened at the LA Zoo. They had people who were, who were tagging and, and, and you know, putting graffiti on their buildings. And they're asking, well, what if, we, what if we put a wall up for them to express themselves? Then maybe they wouldn't be tagging our buildings. And so you see a, a group that starts with deep skepticism for empathy, switch all the way from, all the way over to people who are doing harm, how they were perceiving doing harm to their, to their facility. So I, I think, I think animals are a safe entry and you can see that bridge happen pretty quickly between people and animals. And, and it's really just that, that practice, the chewing on it, the, that discussion, because, you know, to Cinnamon's point, taking a class is not really, you know, the, it's not the content that matters. It's the work that you're doing, as others have said, like thinking about it, challenging your own assumptions, understanding how you fit into the puzzle. So I, I think the more time you spend with it, the more time, the more work that you do, the more empathetic you can become and the more empathetic you can, the, the better you'll be at applying that to not only your context, but your community context and beyond. This is wonderful. Thank you all for sharing, you know, all these amazing insights. And, and um, of course, this was a conversation starter, you know, 
and and probably the first of its kind so yay to us we did it you know <laughs> and uh, we're exploring something new here i think and and i would love it if we can um, continue this conversation and uh, i'm sure you know there'll be much exchange between the panelists and uh, uh but uh, and, and, and if you have any ideas how this platform can be of use to further this conversation, do let me know, because this is, to me, this is also an experimental platform, uh, you know, and, and uh, from going back to the yesterday's uh, theme of uh, intermixed, uh, which was, by the way, uh, the title of a uh, Rumi poet poem, uh, and, uh, and we were, I think, all inspired that the possibility that uh, there's the space in between of things and then uh, and that's where actually what we are doing right now we are intermixing uh, all our you know edges and you know boundaries and really going into a new realm and creating this new platform uh, all together and and I would love us to perhaps you know the panelists to reflect on some of the comments uh, that uh, were uh, put in the chat you know in the last you know five uh, ten minutes that we have uh, Greg, uh, I would appreciate it if you could guide us, please. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. And I know that um, many of our panelists have been following along the chat comments um, throughout your discussion. Uh, and these comments have been very rich and provocative. And so I turn it to any of you. Um, CT, I know that you've been following along real time. Um, anything that leaps out at you that you want to respond to? Sorry, technical error, <laughs> user error. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. When I first moved to um, Bentonville, Arkansas from um, Harlem, New York, um, I think I got a crash course in empathy really quickly um, because I had to work. I was in earlier on in my career and I had to work with folks who had grown up kind of wanting to work at this big company in the middle of you know Arkansas for their whole lives. They did not look like me. They were 20 years my senior, and yet I was a part of their management. And I use that kind of visual because I think that someone put in the chat, you know, when I said about understanding all perspectives, they put it about the even the, the MAGA perspective. And the answer is yes. The answer is that in order to practice empathy, you have to push yourself outside of your own perspective. Ibrahim said it, Jim said it, some other folks said it. It's not a just about your perspective. That doesn't equal empathy. <laughs> empathy really pushes you past where you're willing to go. Um, and so the answer is yes. I just want to respond back to that comment and just <laughs> use a personal example. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, something I will add, just what you were saying, CT reminded me. Right after I published my book, I got a signet ring and it says empathy on it. <laughs> And um, as like a gift to myself to be like, oh, you published a book, congratulations. But also it's like on days that I feel like I need to have empathy for myself, I turn the empathy inward, right? And then I, on, on the days when I feel like I need more empathy for others, I turn it outward. So it's kind of like an internal thing. But I think that's really um, kind of a microcosm for me, what we think about when we talk about like um, in the bigger context of um, empathy, I talk about the head, the heart, the hand. That's why the front of my book has those three things and it's a primary colors because it's essential to learning. But um, the head piece, um, which I described in the chat, but I wanted to add just a uh, flavor to this is that research is showing that if you do not eat like cognitive empathy, which is where the head is, is where like, am I willing to take your perspective? And I'm only willing to take your perspective if I value who you are and where you Correct. come from, right? So if you don't even have that, and also cognitive empathy is a choice, right? So you have to make a conscious choice every single day to, and that's the first step in empathy. There's two other steps after that. So, so I would just um, put that as like my final mindset is like, we have to choose and keep going in and leaning into the empathy, which I'm sure everybody on this call is probably already doing, but to, you know, do a little bit more. We need, a, we need all we can get. And I would just add, and I, I see in the chat that someone's referring to Langurian and, and how she talks about a radical inclusion and other 
topics. And I appreciate what CT said too about empathy for the folks that you're really maybe on the whole other end of the spectrum from. And empathy helps you figure out how to navigate those conversations, be present in the exchange. But one of the things that I think we don't practice well as a society or as folks who really want to be part of a change um, making situation is the ability to reduce harm wherever possible. So you can be empathetic to this moment, but if that individual is creating active harm, how do you intercede disrupt? And I think one of the dangers, uh, if we don't practice that as we practice our um, empathy is that we become bystanders um, because of that concern. And to me, I've been focusing a lot on that because I know I fail miserably at times in those exchanges where I'm trying to bring my best self and be empathetic, but also know that people are being harmed. Where do I come in? Where do I intercede? Where am I an ally, co-conspirator, what have you? Um, that's this really delicate balance that the more we can wed our deepening of, of empathy and empathetic strategies with um, bystander avoidance, the better. Thank you, Cinnamon. Any of our other panelists have any thoughts that you want to add or reflections on some of the commentary that we're seeing in the chat box? Yeah, can I add um, just one quick point? So I saw quite a bit around, you know, like really like the, the title and of, you know, designing for empathy and how might we actually go about doing that. And when, you know, we talked a lot about of empathy as part of the process, but then, you know, if we want empathy to kind of be that end product, what does that look like? Uh, I think I think it's interesting with empathy in, in some senses that, and how, so right now I'm working, working on a project around creating an immersive restaurant in Paris that basically tries to bring empathy through food and kind of cultural discovery. And one of the theories or things that we're working through is, is a lot of the times with empathy, is it kind of has to be the byproduct, you know, because if, if you kind of tell someone in a, webinar lecture, like you need to be, and Jim kind of alluded to this as well, like you need to be more empathetic or like these people are suffering and, and understand their situation. People can sometimes get a bit defensive and then you know they get stuck more in their ways, particularly the people who maybe need to have more of that empathy versus you know people like here who are already kind of bought into this as, as being a, a individual and social need. So, so I think in, in some some senses it's it's using could, what situations and contexts can we create and cultivate that in doing so will eventually lead to more empathy, but people kind of don't realize it as it's happening. Um, so we talked about, you know, like kind of role playing and, and things like this and just immersing yourself in a situation and by doing so, then I think that that's where some some people who may, you know, still not kind of bought in yet. Uh, it provides more of a safe space for people to kind of slowly transition into really recognizing that um, was one. And, and then a second kind of with that, I think it's important to remember too that, you know, there are kind of these core elements around empathy, but then how people empathize is also different. So I think being aware of that too, that it can kind of manifest itself in different ways. And, you know, there's um, applied empathy, but by, by Michael Venturi also talks about kind of these empathy archetypes and you know we like I may be uh, I empathize in, in one way which may be different from someone else so I think also recognizing those differences when we're having those types of conversations um, to see that it's not necessarily just a spectrum of you know zero to high in terms of empathy but then there's also like a how um, as well. Exactly exactly thank you Ibrahim um, that's that's a very important point I think um, maybe before we wrap it up, you know, I uh, would like to say that's one of the reasons I think that museums could be one of the places because they do have um, sort of like, if you call it like little mirrors where we can react to in, in all kinds of different contexts from the environment to natural history, to civil rights, to children's, to, you know, science, to art these could be used as context for us to experience this, experience ourselves experiencing empathy and but noticing and articulating how we, and, and the more we have these kind of experiences around, 
the more it will they will become a part of the um, our routine you know and how we engage in the world currently they are not available even as an option you know i mean in most places but imagine that like this becomes uh, a sort of a natural offering of uh, the museum of a museum and and i'm using i mean museums uh, we started in museums but i also believe that you know libraries performing arts centers uh, playgrounds national parks they all have, you know, um, areas to, uh, you know, ways to contribute to this intentionally, in an intentional and perhaps in a collective way, so that we can learn from each other along the way. And and I, before we wrap up, I would love to um, ask uh, Adive a question. And and uh, <laughs> thank you for your courage to be here, and or CT also, you know, because they. Uh, uh, they, they felt like, you know, oh, we don't do anything with museums, but, you know, I mean, hopefully it is a little bit more uh, clear now that what we are trying to uh, do. Uh, and um, so I was wondering, Adib, from your perspective, um, how do you see what we have talked about, you know, so far? And, and to me, I mean, yes, empathy is complex and we talked, uh, and naturally we talked about why it is complex and so many angles of it. But at the end of the day, museums are actively working on creating empathy building practices in their own ways, in arts museums, children's museums, zoos and aquariums and other places. Um, so, and there's no you know, off the shelf product, uh, but these are waiting to be customized. You know, they're waiting for a hand basically to reach out so a collaboration can begin. And, you know, what questions should be should we be asking you know to further this uh dialogue yeah thank you ali first of all i don't feel i'm that courageous i think you all are the courageous ones i hope that i can be more courageous about bringing these issues especially as i'm working more with with companies and um i also was thinking about this question that ibrahim you mentioned about how do we design empathy together and uh so again coming from the perspective of companies who i'm working with I don't think right now there is a there's a commonly understood definition of when we say empathy, what we mean by that, especially if I think about the very different types of companies who I'm working with, you know, from Pfizer to MasterCard to Prudential to Dow Chemical to Saudi Aramco, where at least you and I met. Uh, if you ask people within the company, well, what do you think empathy is and why is it important to your work? We'd get very different answers, right? So first of all, I think having some, and it doesn't, have to be that, oh, it's just like one phrase, everyone agrees on these five words, but a little bit more of a common understanding of what we mean when we say empathy, I think would, would go a long way in, in creating a better understanding of why it's important to, to companies. I think dialogues like this is very important. Um, as, as I mentioned to you, Elif, I'm not normally uh, spending a lot of time with researchers and scholars who are immersed in empathy or um, leaders in the you know, zoo, aquarium, found, uh, um, museum fields. Um, and so I, I'm learning a lot. And I think if I think about natural entryways into large companies, you know, chief human resources or chief talent officers, um, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion officers, I think those could be a good starting point. I wouldn't be satisfied for those to be the end point because I think this has to permeate through the entire company from CEOs to line managers, to factory workers, to heads of you know, brands and products. But I think those roles could be good entry points because I think they would naturally understand why empathy is, is important. And then the, 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 the last point I'll mention is going back to this idea of shared value. You know, Companies, for better or worse, companies are motivated by profits. We do live in an imperfect capitalist society. And so I think the more we can make the connection to why empathy can help companies um, engage on issues, not just because it's the right thing to do, which is important, but also because it can help them be more successful as a company and, and help them be more commercially successful, I think we'll be, um, we'll be in a better place for making the case for empathy within companies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you all again for this uh, lively conversation. And I hope we get to continue what we have started. Uh, and. Uh, and if you have any questions or you know uh, any uh, contact information or anything, just I think some of you already shared their contact information. But uh, if I can be of help, 
just let me know. <laughs> and uh, with that, I guess, Greg, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Alex. indeed. Um, what a rich conversation um, from all of you. Thank you so much. And for those of you engaging in the, the chat with your comments and, and questions, equally rich, um, just really uh, empowering to see everybody engage like this. Uh, but thank you all. We are a few minutes over our scheduled time. So we're gonna take a quick five minute break before we move over into the second part of our program. So um, set your timers and come on back in about five minutes, grab some water, tea, go take a stretch, whatever you need to do. And we'll see you back in five minutes. Thank you all. Thank you, yay. Hey, Greg and Alice, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of the cool kids. <laughs> oh, thank you. Later. Cool thank kids. You so thank you, nice to be on <laughs> panel with all of you. And welcome back, everyone. Delighted to have you join us as we continue our exploration of all things empathy after a really rich conversation this morning. Thank you all for participating. Alif, I turn it over to you now to take us into the next part of our program. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, and um, so uh, we will begin uh, our uh, next uh, session, uh, which has uh, two presentations, uh, two uh, research studies that were just published uh, about uh, empathy uh, in uh, virtual reality and in its relation to uh, theater. So first we will hear from uh, Alison Jane uh, Martignano and then uh, on her study uh, in empathy's relationship to uh, VR experiences and then uh, Stephen Rathje from uh, University of Cambridge uh, on the role of empathy in theater. Uh, and then uh, they will be joined by uh, Andrew Nehmer, tap, tap dance artist, and Winslow Porter is the co-founder and director of New, Re New Reality Company uh, and creative director of RNGA. Uh, and, and he uh, just taught me a new uh, term in our uh, Zoom you know, check-in calls uh, called extended reality. So let's see how all this will uh, mash up and uh, inspire us. Uh, Alison, thank you again for being here. I believe you are currently at the National Institutes of Health and uh, you have just published this study. So I would appreciate it if you can just take it from here. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the promises and pitfalls of using virtual reality to enhance empathy. Uh, as Alif mentioned, um, I'm Alison Jane Martin Gano, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the National Institutes of Health, the Social and Behavioral Research Branch, uh, where I investigate empathy, communication, and the impact of emerging technologies on health. Uh, today, though, I'm going to present work conducted with colleagues at Indiana University, the New School of Social Research, and Stanford University. So does VR increase empathy? In a popular TED talk, Chris Milk claimed that VR was the ultimate empathy machine. And since then, there has been a proliferation of research and commentary on whether VR lives up to this promise. Part of the unique promise of virtual reality is that it relieves the burdensome cognitive requirements of traditional perspective taking. So virtual reality experiences replace users' sensory experiences with the experiences of another person, thereby performing the perspective taking act on behalf of the user. In other words, users don't have to imagine what it's like to be in someone else's shoes because they're virtually walking in them. For this reason, many national and international charities collaborate with technology companies to use VR to depict what it's like to be in hard to imagine situations, such as in a refugee camp. But does virtual reality really increase empathy? Trying to answer this question led me to two subsidiary questions. What type of VR and what type of empathy? So there are many types of technologies that can be included under the definition of VR or as extended reality, as Ilu pointed out earlier, uh, there's lots of different terms in this field. Uh, the majority of research has considered the impact of immersive virtual environments administered through a head mounted display unit. These systems block out noise and visual input from the real world and replace it with perceptual input from a virtual environment. But less immersive simulations also exist that run on normal desktop computers or even audio only simulations. Uh, it's a very famous audio simulation of what it might be like to have auditory hallucinations uh, with a person with schizophrenia. 
VR experiences also differ in the extent to which you can interact with them. So many experiences use controllers or motion detectors to increase interactivity. When we're considering whether virtual reality increases empathy, we also need to consider what type of empathy we're talking about. Social psychologists generally agree that there are two main types of empathy, emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. Emotional empathy refers to the extent to which a person experiences emotion in response to someone else's emotions. This can be broken further down into empathic concern and emotion matching. Emotion matching is where you feel the same emotion as someone else. So someone feels sad, so you feel sad. Someone feels angry, so you feel angry. Empathic concern is where you respond emotionally, but not with the same emotion. For example, you may see someone who is sad and you may feel compassion for them that they are sad. On the other hand, cognitive empathy refers to understanding what another person is experiencing without necessarily emotionally responding at all. You can sort of think of these two types of empathy as empathy with your heart, emotional empathy, and empathy with your head, cognitive empathy. So to answer our question, like all good scientists, we conducted a systematic research of the literature. We looked for all the research studies out there that exposed participants to virtual reality and then measured their empathy. Personally, I had the fun job of reading through all 5,571 research articles to find articles that look like they may be eligible, of which there were 197. I then examined the full text of these articles and found that 47 were actually eligible for inclusion, uh, but sadly four were not included in our final analysis as they did not report the data we needed and we weren't able to obtain this from the authors. So overall, this left us with 43 articles with a total of 5,644 participants. We then combined these results of all these studies using meta-analysis. And overall, we found that VR experiences increased empathy. Yay. Uh, this had an effect size of about 0 0.4, which is a medium-sized effect. So participants who viewed a VR experience reported almost half a standard deviation more empathy than those who didn't. However, you can see that the dispersion of the effects is greater than would be expected by random chance, suggesting that in some cases, VR is more effective than others. So you can see from the circles on this chart here that some of these studies are reporting huge increases in empathy and others less so. So what makes some of these studies more effective than others? To our surprise, it was not how immersive the VR was. You can see on this graph an almost completely straight line showing that even highly immersive experiences were no more effective at producing empathy than cheaper, less immersive technology. Similarly, interactivity also appeared to have no significant relationship to empathy improvements. However, we did find that VR experiences had different effects on each type of empathy. VR improved emotional empathy significantly more than cognitive empathy. In fact, VR experiences appear to have no effect on cognitive empathy at all. This suggests that VR technology may lend itself to arousing empathic feelings, but not to improving people's understanding of other people's mental states. In other words, VR leaves so little to the imagination that people may lose the opportunity to practice their perspective taking skills themselves. So what are the implications of these results? For those who wish to use VR to arouse emotional empathy, our results suggest there's no need to invest in high-tech, immersive, and interactive experiences. Cheaper alternatives are just as effective. However, because emotional empathy is unlikely to remain long once the VR goggles are taken off, if educators wish to create longer lasting changes in empathy, they may want to consider interventions that help users practice their perspective taking skills. This might involve imagination exercises, discussing or elaborating on things they've read about in the news, or anything else that challenges people to engage in effortful perspective taking. I should add that I don't think VR is incapable of prompting people's perspective taking. There are certainly some wonderful VR experiences out there that are thoughtfully designed to get people to engage in their own thinking. What I caution against here is the assumption that VR will automatically do this. Finally, VR may still be effective for philanthropic purposes to the extent that charities can capitalize on the emotional rush triggered by VR. This was actually the question I was most interested in following up myself. Is the emotional empathy triggered by VR sufficient to change behavior and increase donations? And to answer this, me and my colleagues conducted an experiment. So 155 participants came into our research lab at the New School for Social Research. 
and watched a VR experience or a control experience for 12 minutes. We then measured their empathy levels. We then paid participants $10 in $10 bills, and participants were told they could donate to UNICEF if they wished, and if they wished to, to leave money in an envelope. Participants were then left alone to make their donation or not. Approximately 10 days later, participants completed another questionnaire at home that measured their empathy levels again to see if they lasted over time. During this experiment, participants were randomly assigned to either a virtual reality condition or a control condition. The VR conditions watched a 360 degree VR video called The Displace, which is a documentary style video about three children who have been driven from their homes by war and is produced by the New York Times. Let me show you a quick clip. Oops. Okay, so both participants in the classic and the boost conditions watched the same VR video. Participants in the boost condition were additionally instructed to take the perspective of the children. There were also two control groups. Participants assigned to the audiobook control condition listened to the experiences of the same three refugee children, the text of which was also written by New York Times journalists. And the final control group was a waiting room control, which involved a 360 degree video of an empty conference room. The video was the same high quality of the VR conditions, but with obviously very different content. So what were our results? Here are the results for emotional empathy. The red and pink bars show results from two different questionnaire measures of emotional empathy, but they both show the same trend in results. The VR conditions, classic and boost, significantly increase participant, participants' emotional empathy compared to both the waiting room and the audiobook control. However, the results for self-reported cognitive empathy look a little bit different. Although the VR conditions are still outperforming the waiting room control, they are no more effective at increasing cognitive empathy than the audiobook. After 10 days, the benefit of VR for empathy is largely diminished. VR only remains significantly higher compared to an audiobook on one of the empathy scales, and all the other differences are insignificant. Of perhaps the greatest practical significance, there was no significant difference in the amount participants donated depending on the condition they were in. Participants were no more likely to donate after watching VR, and if they did donate, it was not likely to be in any higher amounts. So these results challenge the accepted wisdom of philanthropic organizations who have flocked to VR in recent years to solicit donations. Given the cost of creating VR experiences, nonprofits may want to reconsider their investment in VR as it does not appear to outperform cheaper, more traditional donation solicitation methods. But overall, what are the promises and pitfalls of using VR to increase empathy? So on the plus side, uh, it's, VR is more effective than low-tech solutions at promoting feelings of emotional empathy in the short term. And the novelty of VR may attract a wider audience than more traditional um, methods. On the negative side, though, VR is no more effective than low-tech solutions at prompting feelings of cognitive empathy, and the emotional effects are generally short-lived and may not result in behavior change, such as donations. And of course, I should add on here, it is also quite costly. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm linking my these papers in the chat if anybody would like to read more. And of course, I'd be happy to answer your questions later. Thank you, Alison. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll have, I've already seen that there are some really great comments and questions which we will get to after uh, Steve's, uh, Steven's uh, presentation. Uh, would, do, did you have a presentation, Steven, or? Uh... I, I do, I can share the okay. screen now. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, let's see, share. Okay, and let me put awesome. in into presentation mode. Um, are you all able to see my screen and hear me? 
Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. I assume others can too then. Um, cool. Well, um, thank you, uh, Allison, for that wonderful presentation. And also thank you for um, uh, thank you for inviting me to this to talk about my um, studies I recently conducted on theater and empathy. Uh, so my name is Steve Rathjay, and I am a psychology PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge in my final year. And I'm going to present on a series of studies that I recently published on the relationship between theater and empathy. So a lot of us in theater and the arts have the intuition that theater is not just mere entertainment, but theater can also lead to powerful increases in social skills, such as empathy, and potentially lead to social change. I think uh, John Leguizamo's quote at the 2018 Tony Awards during one of his acceptance speeches really captures this intuition well. He said, theater teaches us how to understand other people, how to feel empathy for those who are unlike us. I was a theater artist since I was a young child in the Portland theater community. I was both an actor and a playwright, and I certainly shared this intuition. I thought theater was something much more than just something to entertain people, but something that can change people's minds and make people care about people who are different from them. But as I began to study psychology during my undergrad, I was surprised on how little evidence there was in the psychological literature on the effects of live theater and the effects of live theater specifically on empathy. Um, so this led me to set out to conduct a series of studies, which we recently published in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Um, these studies were conducted with my um, collaborators, Lior Hackle, who is a psychology professor at USC, as well as Jamil Zaki, who's a psychology professor at Stanford, and also wrote a great book about empathy called The War for Kindness. And essentially, we investigated how attending live theater can improve empathy, change people's socio-political attitudes and potentially increase pro-social behavior in a large-scale study incorporating more than 1,600 audience members. So I'll talk a little bit about the methods of the study now. So uh, we partnered with two theater companies. One was Artist Repertory Theater in my hometown of Portland, Oregon, and the other was the Public Theater in New York. And um, the general methods behind our studies were um, these 1,622 audience members were either given surveys immediately before or immediately after attending three different plays. And these pre and post show surveys were alternating every other night. So one night audience members would receive pre-show surveys, another night they'd receive post-show surveys. So this was a between subjects experiment and audience members weren't in the pre-show condition, weren't aware that there were other audience members in the post-show condition. So this allowed us to uh, essentially um, get at people's psychological states immediately before and immediately after attending live theater. So in these surveys, we asked people questions about their empathy toward groups of people depicted in the place. And these questions were taken by psychological measures, both about perspective taking, so more about cognitive empathy, as well as empathic concern, so more about emotional empathy. Um, and these were directed toward specific groups of people depicted in the plays. I'll talk a bit more about the themes in the play on the next slide to give you greater context of this. People were also asked about their attitudes, about socio-political issues related to the plays. Lastly, people were given the opportunity to either um, keep a portion of money for themselves or donate a small portion of money to charity, either before or after attending the plays. And we both measured charities that were related to the themes of the play, as well as charities that were unrelated to the themes of the play, to see if maybe theater can get at a more um, generalizable, uh, theater can lead to a more generalizable sense of pro-social behavior and not just make people care more about the specific themes covered in the plays. So the specific plays we looked at, one was called Skeleton Crew by Dominique Marceau, ran in 2018 at Artist Repertory Theater. Um, and this play was about auto workers in Detroit after the 2008 financial crisis. And it covered a lot of themes that um, were socially relevant and might, you know, you might expect 
these themes to increase people's empathy. So uh, themes such as income inequality and homelessness and racial discrimination. Another play we looked at was the Pulitzer Prize winning play Sweat by Lynn Nottage. And this play was produced by the Public Theater in New York, but it wasn't actually produced in New York. This was a very um, interesting production conducted by the Public Theater. They, as an outreach program, decided to have this play tour to 18 different cities throughout the Midwest. Um, and these were more conservative uh, or more rural areas of the country than uh, Portland, Oregon, which is where Artist Repertory Theater was. So this gave us a really interesting opportunity to look at the effects of live theater in the context of a um, slightly more conservative uh, population as well as the more liberal population. So that's, this was a really interesting opportunity for us. Uh, and Sweat had similar themes to Skeleton Crew. It was about factory workers in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, the last play we looked at was Wolf Play. Um, produced by Artist Repertory Theater in 2019. And uh, Wolf Play was about um, a same-sex couple trying to adopt a child. Um, so a number of plays that looked at very different themes. Um, and uh, here, uh, here is a summary of our results. Uh, so after the plays, audience members reported feeling more empathy toward the groups of people depicted in the plays. So for instance, for Wolf Play, we ask people about their empathy, uh, both empathic concern and perspective taking towards same-sex couples. Um, and this increased people's empathy about that topic. Additionally, people expressed attitudes that were more consistent with the themes of the play after seeing the show as opposed to before seeing the show. So these attitudes questions uh, for shows like Sweat or Skeleton Crew would look at um, topics such as income inequality or homelessness or racial discrimination. And uh, we created an overall composite index to see how people's attitudes changed. And uh, lastly, and really interestingly, people donated more to a charity um, related to the themes of the play after seeing the show. And also people donated more to a charity unrelated to the themes of the play after seeing the show. So the unrelated charity we looked at was um, uh, Meals on Wheels, which um, helps, uh, helps provide care for uh, more elderly people. And uh, so this was unrelated to the themes of the show and people donated more to this after seeing the play. And uh, this raises a really interesting question. Can theater evoke a more generalized sense of pro-social behavior that is unrelated to the specific topics explored in the play? And our results would uh, seem to suggest yes in this particular context. Um, so if you wanna get a greater sense of how uh, the effect sizes and the stats varied by show, um, here's a table of effect sizes and an internal meta-analysis. Um, as you can see, some of the effect sizes varied, and uh, in some contexts, uh, they weren't fully significant, but the general pattern was that live theater changed people's attitudes, um, led to increased empathy, and led to increased donations to charity. What you also see in this table of effect sizes is um, results involving something called known as the narrative transportation scale. So the narrative transportation scale is a validated psychological scale that has questions such as, I felt immersed or lost in the themes of the story. It essentially looks at how transported people were by the narrative. And interestingly, the effects were stronger, both the effects on empathy, attitudes, and charitable donations for people who felt most immersed in the plays. Uh, so this potentially gets a, a, a mechanism behind why uh, theater is able to increase empathy and change people's minds. Um, it seems like perhaps the feeling of immersion or being lost in a story, which you can certainly get from fiction, VR, film. There are lots of ways to make you feel immersed in a story. And uh, of course, there is also literature out there suggesting that fiction can increase empathy. Um, and while we didn't specifically compare the effects of attending live theater to the effects of engaging in other art forms, uh, the results involving the narrative transportation scale um, 
to me suggests that because theater is so immersive, um, it might have um, some sort of special impact. But future research definitely needs to look at the effects of theater as compared to the effects of film, fiction, and other art forms. But our study with a large sample certainly um, provides some of the first evidence that um, theater can uh, increase people's empathy, change attitudes, and lead to actual pro-social behavior. Um, so these results are significant because um, they provide tangible evidence of the effects of live theater in potentially um, actually changing people's minds as opposed to just being mere entertainment. And I think these results are especially significant after the coronavirus pandemic when theaters were closed for about a year and a half and are just starting to reopen now. Uh, a lot of theaters were really struggling. A lot of theater artists were really struggling. And it's gonna take a lot for theater to come back. And um, even before the coronavirus, theater um, was always threatened. There is limited government arts funding supporting theater artists. Their um, arts education classes in schools are often being cut, especially in low income schools. And uh, I think without concrete evidence of the effects of theater and the arts, uh, arts, our risk is being branded as a luxury. So I think it is important that artists work with scientists to really look at the benefits of um, attending live theater or acting or engaging in other art forms. And uh, as a final note, while some of our effects were um, small to medium by social psychological standards, I think when you multiply these effects by how many people attend theater around the globe, so um, statistics suggest that around 44 million US adults attend theater every year, um, and many more do in the United States. So when you multiply these effects by the amount of people who are impacted by theater, and also the amount of people who are impacted by the arts in general, I think this suggests that theater and the arts can really be a vehicle for increasing empathy and promoting social change. Um, thank you very much. Uh, here's some of my contact info. If you have more questions, I can also put um, the uh, a link to the paper in the chat. Excellent. Thank you so much, Steve. And as um, a theater person and as a museum person, both, I, I really appreciate not only what you presented here, but also its implications for museum practice as a couple of our colleagues in the chat box have started to respond to. So we will certainly get to um, uh, a more group uh, collective Q&A period in just a bit. But I, um, Elif, is there anything that you wanted to add here before we jump into our panel discussion with Andrew and Winslow? Thank you, Greg, thank you. And um, um, very, very informative uh, uh, presentations. Thank you very much. I mean, um, I don't have a you know, science background, but uh, and I'm trying to you know, wrap my head around the, your, your findings and, and how I can translate it into what I'm doing, I'm trying to do. And, and, um, and in transitioning to the other uh, uh, section where we have Andrew and uh, Winslow also join us, I would like to pose all of you a question altogether. Uh, because my curiosity is, what are the qualities, of, what is the experience like in theater versus uh, VR or extended realities? Uh, Stephen mentioned immersion, but he also mentioned that this can be also happening in when reading fiction or in a VR experience. Um, so I have this uh, concept that I'm uh, working on, which is called the alchemy of empathy, which is about the qualities of the experience. What are those ingredients, the, the magical things that, you know, we often, you know, we don't even articulate them because we sometimes take them for granted, uh, not in a scientific sense, but uh, I guess as a feeling, you know. Uh, so I'm very interested in uh, these descriptions of the experience, you know, immersion was one, and I can perhaps include that uh, collective journeying uh, like in theater or a shared experience, 
perhaps theater has a more of a shared ex real life shared exp experience like a community experience group experience versus a vr or the extended realities experience which could be just happening to one person perhaps uh, and i don't know much about you know these technologies and their capabilities um, uh, so i would really appreciate it if you can also help me understand you know what are some of the uh, qualities that you, you see or you have noticed that can distinguish them from one another and, and from other real life experiences. And this is a question for all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I also want to, before we go into our panel discussion, I wanted to um, share with Steve and Allison both how much I appreciated your presentations of your, your research projects and your respective projects. I happen to have a number of my graduate students in the museum professions program at Seton Hall University in the audience right now. So I especially appreciated you modeling for them what, what research looks like and what the presentation of your research looks like uh, in two very different but interconnected realms. So uh, thank you for that as well. So let's, uh, let's shift gears just slightly and then we'll circle back around with Q&A a little bit later. Um, and I would love to welcome our colleagues, Winslow and, and Andrew to talk a little bit. Um, well, first, uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, maybe we'll start with Andrew and then, and then Winslow and, and the context of why you're even here and then we'll head into a conversation. Sure. Thank you, Greg. Um, thank you, Ali, for the invitation. Very happy to be here. My name is Andrew Nimmer. I am a tap dance artist. Uh, I met Alif at the World Summit for Innovation and Entrepreneurship many years ago and was invited to contribute to the book. Uh, my work sits at the intersection of oral tradition, artistic expression, and um, teaching, really. Uh, tap dancing has a cultural that's a cultural form it's been found to have some popularity in the market so it's transferred to a commercial skill and it uh, encourages the the expression of individual voices through the creation interpretation and improvisation within the form so uh, my work here um, with regards to empathy is just really around the tools that i found useful to get uh, people to dance together. Great, thanks. Um, and and Andrew, before I scoot on, you, of course you know I love that picture of you with your shoe. I think it's so evocative of uh, the very root of, of everything that you do. So um, I Thank love you. it. Um, Winslow, tell us a little bit about you and, and your connection to empathy. Sure, well, again, yeah, thanks for having me, Greg and Alif. Um, I would say my connection is through exploring the recently possible. And, and that means, uh, I guess, another intersection would be uh, art and technology and design and really how par the participant journey, you know, how do we consider people who maybe aren't as familiar with technology? We're being onboarded for the first time. How do they first, you know, understand the technology? And then how do they understand the narrative? through that and there's a lot of different stories that can be told really infinite amount of stories um, specifically the work that that my studio and i do is is trying to uh, allow people to understand things that are outside of their own realm of of you know of experience and we've created uh, social impact stories where you imagine what it's like to be in a conflict zone um, also where you imagine what it's like to be a tree in an experience called tree which is not something that you can really uh, witness on, you know, in this terrestrial life that we have, you know, other ways that you could possibly do it would be through poetry or through, you know, psychotropic substances. But for us, we like to leverage the ability for technology to transport us in, in other places. Um, so our, our studio, New Reality Company, um, we've, we've traveled uh, with our experiences uh, in many different places. And we seeing that there's a nice overlap uh, between the science and art communities, as well as, um, you know, political events, environmental conservation events, um, and, you know, people who are just curious about how they can also use this technology to tell stories, uh, you know, their own stories or stories that might be difficult to, to, 
to understand, say, on a page or through, you know, spoken word. Uh, we're seeing that there's new ways that we can use our senses to really understand and embody uh, complex narratives through this, this technology. So I'm excited to, to dig into that a little bit more with everyone here. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, and speaking of senses, I'm going to toss this back to, to you, Andrew, because what you do um, in your, your teaching and focusing on oral tradition and artistic expression is very much a, a sensory experience. I wonder if you might talk about that just a little bit. Sure. Uh, tap dancing is, a, is an embodied craft. Right. We have we use all faculties. We sit at the intersection of movement and sound making. So we have the responsibilities of a dancer in terms of creating particular visual expressions and also the responsibilities of a musician to create sounds at uh, reasonable intervals so as to <laughs> convey a, a musical message. Um, and in, in that space, once you have two dancers doing that at the same time, there's a relationship in multiple spheres, right? There's the relationship of, are they moving at the same time, especially from an observer's standpoint, and the relationship of the music that they're creating. Um, so a lot of my work as a, as a teacher in this space is trying to get the dancers to understand how they're relating to one another. Um, and the thing that's been most interesting for me is realizing that if both dancers are set at doing the quote unquote right thing at the right time, they don't have as much of uh, a possibility of executing well as if they're listening to one another or having a vision of the final presentation that's shared between the two of them. Uh, and so getting dancers to, to understand the dynamic of the relationship between the two of them as they play uh, has been the majority of the, of the work. So it's, it's, a, it's a heightening of the senses of listening, um, not so much of sight, uh, which is interesting, but also of their communal imagination. Although I would argue that their sight and, and the visual of the, the dancing as a medium is really powerful as well because of uh, the physicality and just what the human body does or can do. Um, and the pattern making, as you were describing, two individuals coming together or the, the visual of, of the shoe on the floor, um, the tap on the shoe, um, very, very strong visuals. Um, so I wonder if, um, Winslow, as you're hearing Andrew talking about this, you know, Andrew is talking about a very visceral kind of experience and you're talking about a, perhaps a virtual or a technology, technology focused experience. Um, where's the intersection? Where, where do you see what you're doing being really the same as what Andrew's doing? Well, I think they're all human experiences, even if it's something that you're witnessing the life, say, of a tree, um, which I referenced earlier, it's still you experiencing it. And we still are doing it with the same senses that we use to witness and explore our daily life. So it's something that's very familiar. It's obviously not the same sort of, um, you know, use case or the same exact way in which, you know, same order of operations. But, you know, these are our senses that we know and we trust and we've used to navigate you know, to get us to this point in our life. And we've evolved as humans to be able to use these senses, you know, not just, I think we overlook some of our other senses, like, you know, our sight is sort of the most dominant, you know, the ocular dominance um, is something that is a paradigm that many people have a, a sort of a problem under or shying away from or, or seeing that there's seeing that there's other ways to experience our reality, you know, where we've been using taste and smell to, you know, when we were hunters and gatherers to understand if things were safe to eat. And those were, you know, things that we relied on for, for homeostasis. And that's an important thing to consider, but now we can use those same things and be able to leverage them in a new way to be able to heighten our understanding of who we are. And also um, uh, Andrew brought up a, a, you know, interesting, point of not just experiencing something you know singularly 
uh, but also having you know uh, somebody else who's there with you. And I think that that's an important uh, consideration as well, not just if you're witnessing, uh, say, an immersive virtual reality project, that knowing that there's somebody else who created it and that you're sharing a moment, you know, granted, not it's non-linearly uh, because they've created something that you can watch on your own time. But there's also some really impressive use cases and experiences uh, that can be witnessed between multiple people in a multiplayer virtual reality or, you know, extended reality, you know, or it could be through your screen, you know, being able to have a massive multiplayer online game where you can become any character you want you know in another realm with other people who are also willing to buy into this paradigm i think is something that is you know can be extremely rewarding and also we see that we have the ability to live a life outside of ourselves, and it brings up all sorts of other questions but again you know we use our senses that we're familiar with to onboard us onto this this new reality and it's those as long as those are, are done in a way that that are familiar enough and that we trust and that is something that's also important to consider is the storyteller you know making sure that they are you know onboarding and and, and they're they're allowing people to feel safe in this environment that's something that is is really paramount when it comes to to this type of storytelling that we see that there's you know the possibilities are, are really limitless in many ways and i hope i answered that question i i sort of darting around a little bit just because there's there's so much to dig into with that no 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 it's it's great um i want to pull apart a couple of things that you said um the first one when you were talking about um gaming massive multiplayer games uh, it made me think of a presentation from many many years ago by dr jane mcgonigal talking about why people engage in these kinds of uh, multi-user experiences and part of it is um, on a fundamental level, the mastery of some mastery of something, so being good at the the thing, but in large part, it is about a shared experience, as you just described, and it's about being a part of something greater than yourself, which I, I think you also hinted at just um, briefly. And then the last thing that you, one of the last things you mentioned, was the nature of storytelling, and. Um, as, as I mentioned before we started, I, I am a theater person, a theater designer, a theater director, and I also happen to be a museum professional and I teach in a, a university environment. So for me, there is an intersection of, of my two worlds, and it's quite simply about storytelling. I believe that theater and um, um, Steve, please feel free to jump in to this conversation if you wish. Um, I believe that uh, theater is about storytelling, telling important stories about the world we live in. Steve, you illustrated that to your example. And I believe museums as an immersive environment also have that power to tell important stories about the world we live in and the people we share the planet with. And I would say dance. Um, uh, Andrea, when you started um, describing this, your first thing you said was oral tradition, which is, storytelling, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. I think fundamentally, the way the way I approach craft making and kind of the responsibilities of the artist is messaging, right? It, it boils down to a thing that we're that I'm sharing with, with others. Um, and there are particular, particular expressions that can't happen in an individual basis, which goes back to the kind of the communal experience. And for me, the idea of communal imagination, this idea that many people gather to create something that they all have a vision of, but can't realize it on their, on an individual scale. Um, but I think, I think in the arts, particularly, the, the craft work, um, th there are some situations in which the craft work is heightened to the end in and of itself. Um, and I think shifting that perspective to focusing on the value of the story or the, the end result of the expression of the art, like how we want shifts in people or what we want people to experience through the through the through the expression whether it's the artist there was a question in the chat about how actors experience empathy or in audiences 
um, both I think are really, really important. Well, and um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I also think of um, theater as involving a, a pretty rich degree of risk taking, um, in, in empowering the audience to um, embrace things that they may not normally um, embrace, which makes me uh, look over here at our chat box uh, where one of our colleagues, this is to you, Winslow, um, with regards to these immersive environments like the um, traumatic, like the, the conflict zone experience, what are the concerns you have about um, the negative impacts, the, the trauma that might be caused by this immersive experience? Um, yeah, that's a great question and something that um, people who work in this space think about a lot. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, I'm not exactly sure, I, in my experience, that I also agree with all the research that was just presented about VR, because um, I've, I've seen other studies and I've also firsthand witnessed some things that are slightly different from those, uh, those studies. I find that if something is more realistic, then it has a sense of actually, you know, it's a chance of somebody who's already witnessed something, a sense of re-traumatizing them. Whereas if you onboard them to the to the trauma that they've experienced, and there's actually all sorts of VR therapies that have been done, where you you do something in a lighter fashion, or you you know you slowly you you slowly acclimate them to their what their trauma was, it can be a, a, an effective way of of allowing them to come to grips with it. Um, but whenever we start an experience, say with Giant, where you're in a family, uh, you're, you're witnessing a family. Uh, during their their last moments in the middle of a conflict, we give the audience a trigger warning before they step into the experience, um, telling them you know roughly what's going to happen without spoiling you know any of any of the the plot. Um, and then some people who have lived in conflict zones have said, you know, I I really appreciate that. I've already witnessed this once. This is something I don't need to deal with. Um, so they they decide to opt out. Um, so that's an important uh, piece of messaging that I think you know anyone who's creating something that has that potential, it's their responsibility as a storyteller to be able to, to put in. But also in the same regard, if it's something that is too soft or too um, you know, padded, I don't think it will necessarily have the same emotional response from the viewer. So there's definitely a fine line that needs to be you know, sort of tread uh, to understand you know, when is it just right? And when are we actually creating something that has enough emotional resonance that it is you know, an effective piece of storytelling and something that isn't just, you know, Sort of gingerly um, stepping around the issue, um, and as a media becomes more realistic and more immersive, I think we have a, a strong chance to, uh, to not just re-traumatize people that have already experienced experienced something similar, but just to just to traumatize people if it's something where the the participant journey isn't taken into consideration. For for tree, there's a, a little bit of a spoiler alert: you grow to become the tallest tree in the forest. Your arms are branches. There's different scents. Uh, that are that are greeting you at different points. There's a fan that uh, that makes it feel like you, you're witnessing this really nice night breeze. But then there's also the distant rumblings of humans, and they slowly get closer and closer. You feel the vibrations through uh, sub pack, which is a, a base transducer that you have strapped to your back to help heighten that experience. Uh, and then you see fires come towards you. But right as the fires, um, you know, surround you, instead of witnessing immolation, which you know, many people are obviously afraid of for, for numerous reasons. Um, you know, you don't have to be pre-traumatized by that. We pull out so that you see it from a third person perspective. And for us, that's really important so that it doesn't, it, it hits the point home, but we're not doing it to a point where people feel like they're, you know, the, once they buy into this illusion, we don't want them to feel as though they're unsafe in any moment. And some people think they're going to fall over at points. So we make sure we, we, we sort of divorce them from that reality that they've witnessed um, in at the right at the appropriate time because there is definitely a responsibility for people telling these stories and understanding that their audiences come from a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. Thanks, Winslow, and I and as you all can see, I I invited Steve and Allison to rejoin this conversation as we wrap up this section. Um, Allison, thoughts, reflections, response to anything that you've heard. Yeah, no, I'd love to jump in. Thank you. Uh, and I sort of want to circle back to at least a sort of overarching question about sort of what do we think that the, the magic uh, ingredients are. Um, so uh, I, I hear Winslow talking a lot about, you know, creating these emotional experiences. And, and I think he's he's got a lot of great expertise in how to how to get that balance right. You were talking about about how to get the right level of emotional arousal. 
out of people in VR. For me, though, I'm more focused on how to arouse the cognitive empathy. Um, uh, when it comes to trying to arouse cognitive empathy from the data that I was sort of talking about earlier, it seems that it's not uh, the immersion uh, that matters. Uh, it's, it really seems to be more about the effort that people have to put in in order to understand it. And I really think these are sort of two different mechanisms to arouse the two different types of empathy. So like the emotional empathy sort of requires this evocative, immersive stimuli, whereas the cognitive empathy, I would argue, requires uh, much more uh, cognitive immersion uh, in the sense that people have to mentally uh, put effort in to imagine what it's like to be in another, another person's position. So I would argue that actually uh, virtual experiences that are sort of more ambiguous, more difficult to interpret, that require people to kind of figure out people's motivations uh, would be the sort of VR experience that would challenge that kind of empathy. So I feel like sometimes there's a bit of a, uh, a push and pull between what we want to do with VR. Do we want to arouse people's emotions or do we want to get people thinking? And Steve, I sort of wanted to bring in your research here because one of the things I think about theater is that it tends to get people think. Obviously, theater arouses our emotions, but it, it also sort of can be really subtle and, and uh, require people to sort of build that plot themselves. Thanks, Allison. Steve, that's a good handoff to you. Right. And um, I think these plays were really thoughtful and did have moments of subtext, they didn't feed things to the audience. And um, so yeah, I, I think as an ingredient to empathy, sort of as Allison said, it might be pieces of literary fiction that make you do a little bit of work, pieces of theater that make you do a little bit of work that might be an ingredient to empathy. That's a really interesting point that I hadn't considered much before, so thank you for that. Uh, one other point I wanted to bring up uh, relates to something Alif brought up about um, the ingredients of empathy. She talked about the importance of shared experiences. So I wanted to briefly touch on that. We weren't specifically uh, able to measure the impact of shared experiences. We just measured the impact of theater. But speculatively, I think that shared experiences and experiencing theater as a collective with an audience, you know, laughing together, reacting together, does potentially have um, help explain theater's increased effects. And to support this, I'm gonna draw on um, some past studies that I know of. There are studies on, uh, that suggest that when people experience things with other people, these experiences are more intense than when they experience them alone. So one study I'm thinking of had people like experience eating a chocolate bar together, like they both eat the chocolate bar, they'd react to it. And they had a more intense, pleasurable experience to the chocolate bar when they shared this. And then another study, they had two people experience a bitter chocolate bar together. And then they had a more um, intense, unpleasant experience when they shared this experience of the bitter chocolate bar. So past research that I know of suggests that shared experiences, they are, they are amplified, they are more intense. So I think that when we are talking about theater, um, we, we have to sort of consider the collective shared experience of it. And I, and I hope that there is more research on that in the future. Absolutely, and I would extend this to something that I, I think I said yesterday. Um, lots of research, lots of uh, studies in the museum field point to three very broad reasons or experiences that museum visitors come with. A, a cognitive intent, they, they want to learn something, they want to build on something they already know or they come for a social experience, something that, it, that engages them with their family, their friends, their school group, and, and often uh, an affective or emotional experience. And um, very frequently, all three of those together, depending on the context. So museums have this power to create everything that, that you are all describing here. Elif, anything that you would like to add here um, as we wrap up this part? Uh, I know we're a few minutes over, um, but uh, I certainly would appreciate your perspective. And then we'll take a, a few minutes break and turn our attention to Erica. Well, thank you so much again. Thanks, Greg, for this uh, conversation. And thank you all for sharing your perspectives. Um, and I've been taking notes about the qualities of empathy. You know, I have my list to work on, you know. And, and I want to bounce them back with you, you know, to see if uh, they resonate, you know, and, and some of them you already, you said these terms, but um, one of the things that I also would like to do, uh, including, you know, getting your feedback on these ideas and can, should we look at them 
a little bit more deeply on their own as the experience, qualities of experience. And also for our audience here, uh, who are some of them are uh, from museums, I would like them to think also, how would these qualities uh, would look like in a museum? Uh, let's say uh, storytelling. Well, storytelling is the easy one, right? I mean, museums are natural storytellers, but still, I think we should we can look at it. Uh, you know, the different ways of telling stories, right? In museum, different kinds of museums, uh, immersiveness, uh, shared or collective experience. Um, and I don't know if synchronicity is the right term, uh, Andrew, but synchronicity, perhaps, you know, tap dancing. And is it different from immersion? You know, and how is it different from immersion? Uh, you know, what, what, is, what is it? Um, seems like if you cannot connect, you cannot synchronize, but maybe, maybe there is, you know, different uh, subtleties uh, between those two experiences. And then, of course, listening. Uh, and listening, the kind of listening that you mentioned was almost like a whole body listening. It is not just the ear, but you kind of sense, you know, like what the other is going to do. It is more than just the oral listening, but it is, feels like it's something more there. And I wonder, you know, if the, that's, that could be something that we could look into uh, in terms of our understanding of what empathy can look like. Uh, and the other one is a communal imagination. Uh, that's also very uh, interesting, right? We're creating a narrative, the story, but is it uh, better in just one person or, uh, you know, more with uh, better with more people? And what are the qualities to make those um, narratives more impactful or more useful for our institutional narrative, our intentions? Um, and then, um, yeah, and then the embodiment. Uh, I think that that's included in all the all the examples. And uh, but what how would these look like in a museum experience? Can, can we tr translate communal imagination in a museum experience? What does collective experiencing sharing would look like in a museum? What does it look like a museum? or synchronicity or uh, embodiment or immersiveness. So I think if we can, I believe, you know, it might to look into these and, and I hope, you know, thank you our, uh, you know, uh, research scientist friends here who joined us uh, with their presentations. I'm hoping that this might uh, bring up some maybe new ideas for uh, future research. And I would love to hear your perspective on that. All right, thank you so much, Elif, and, and thank you all for, for your thoughtful um, presentations and conversation. We're gonna take just a, a three minute break and give yourselves a, a chance to get some water or tea or take a stretch, and then we'll regroup and welcome our next guest. Erica, thanks so much for your patience. We'll see you back in a few moments. Thanks everyone. Hello everyone, welcome back. Thank you for uh, joining us for an engaging first half of our day, our second day of the Designing for Empathy Summit. Excited to uh, continue on for the last part of our program. And Alif, I turn it over to you, thank you. Thank you, Greg. And uh, thank you very much again uh, to all of you for being here. Um, and I, I don't know if uh, Winslow is still here, but I want to, to say something because I think what uh, I forgot to say earlier directly relates to what we are going to experience next in Erica's presentation, which is um, he mentioned that you know there are uh, other ways to experience reality, right? There are different reality. I mean, there's the reality, but we experience it in different ways, and that was a theme that uh, was also from our uh, day one. Kabir Helminski uh, explained how we can experience the universe in different ways, you know, from uh, qualitative, qualitatively and uh, quantitatively. And, uh, and he also mentioned that, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that the human capa capacity for love could be a uniting force. And he mentioned 
I remember that him saying that, you know, the universe can be such a like a cold, you know, dangerous, uh, unknown, you know, uh, space. But I think in this case, uh, an artist's perspective, uh, the, the human capacity of the, of, as an artist, uh, brings us closer to a deep listening uh, of the universe, which I think at the end, what it does is to offer a, us a new perspective in uh, experiencing the reality that way. And, uh, and with that, I would like to welcome Erica Blumenfeld, a uh, transdisciplinary artist and uh, so grateful that you could make it, Erica. And I'm not going to take talk anymore, so I'll just leave the floor to you. Please take us to uh, a journey through the universe, <laughs> through your eyes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elif. This has been such an honor to be a part of, of this summit. And I'm really grateful and honored to be able to share <clears throat> my work with you. Um, I'm gonna just take a quick second to get myself situated here as I share. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. Can you see um, my first slide and you can still hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I am going to share a basically a 30 minute performative talk um, that's <clears throat> an evolving deep dive into my research and my writing, um, which all emerges from my art making practice. And the talk is really an invitation into my studio and into the questions that arise um, through my curiosity and uh, creative processes. And when I was preparing this talk, I, I became immediately curious about the evolution and the history of empathy. And so I started researching um, the word and, and its meaning across time. And of course, I started with just looking it up in my English Oxford Dictionary uh, to learn its origin. And if so, if you have the, the complete compact version like I do, you know it is impossible to read without a magnifying glass. Um, but this lovely thing occurred when I placed the lens on the page, which was that I noticed that the trees and the sunlight in my backyard were being reflected. And I thought, yes, this pretty much captures what I want to talk about. <laughs> um, so, so here we go. In researching and reflecting on the historical writings by philosophers and psychologists in the 19th century who were laying the groundwork for empathy studies, what is persistently clear is that they could not fathom a deep or emotional knowing or understanding of nature. The natural sciences were set apart from the social sciences and the humanities as they remain today. To them, one could only know or understand the mind of another person because there is a shared experience of feeling. The idea that humans can only have empathy for those living beings that humans believe have the ability to possess feelings persists today, and tragically, we thereby systematically remove most of our planet and other species we share it with as being possible recipients of our empathy. And so from that vantage point, an empathy of the elements would be radical. But perhaps that is what is being asked of us as we look toward the future, a radical empathy for an in our entangled ecologies, one that reveres everything that makes up our universe as worthy of knowing and understanding from a place of deep emotional intelligence. I think of myself as both a curiosity seeker and a collector of questions. My artistic inquiries are centered on the places where art, science, nature, and culture converge, propelling me to look for evidence across civilizations to where, as a species, we have sourced meaning from our relationship, our belonging to the natural world. Whether we look into the depths of our body's biochemistry or to our species' earliest artworks, we can find evidence that in both body and imagination, humans derive health and meaning from an active living connection with our natural world. My work as 
as a whole intends to study the notion of an embodied relationship with the cosmos that we are in our very chemistry of and from the stars. My intent is to co cultivate an expanded sense of human connectedness to the natural world, not just our connection with each other and with other species and with our entire Earth system, but even our connection to the systems that governed our planet's formation, as well as our solar systems, expending, extending all the way back to how we might be connected to the moment our universe burst into being. In other words, a connectedness that is at the same instant profoundly personal and intimate, and yet encompasses the whole cosmos. It has been established across many fields that humans have a biological need for a connection with the natural world, not simply for recreation or aesthetic reasons, and not solely for sustenance reasons, but for literal healthy biological function, including the health of our brains and nervous system. There is a term that was established in the mid 1990s within the fields of ecological conservation that has interested me a great deal called shifting baseline syndrome. Originally used to determine baselines in fishery science, the term has now become more broadly used to discuss the decline in our general knowledge of our natural surroundings and how they are changing. There are two types of shifting baselines. The first is generational amnesia where there is loss or extinction of knowledge because younger generations are not aware of what past ecological or biological conditions were once like. The second type is personal amnesia, where knowledge loss or extinction occurs because we individually forget our own experiences of nature conditions. <clears throat> the questions that have arisen from this research go deep. If we, buy, if we have a biological need for our natural world, and yet we generation by generation are forgetting what this natural world was like, and we no longer realize we have a need for it at a fundamental level, then how can we hope to maintain a connection with our natural world that is resolute enough to protect it against further decline and devastation? How can we begin to remember we are inextricably linked to the natural world that evolved us? The questions that have guided my artistic research since the earliest days of my practice are those that seem to continuously seek to locate this sense of connectedness. And my work currently leads me to a specific emotion that I see as a convergence of both personal and cosmic reflection, the feeling of wonder. To me, wonder is a force. It has gravity. I bend toward it. Wonder is the ether of our inner universe, elixir for heart and mind. It is the mysterious encounter with the outer world that forges an ethos of benevolence and humility in the face of vastness. In a moment when we are fully taken by wonder, it is as if somehow we can feel a unity with the object of wonder itself, as if empathy can move beyond the animate and we stand in awe of a starry night or an Antarctic landscape or a glowing ocean or a rock from the moon, seeking with all our faculties to feel and comprehend something of the inanimate. Research in the field of social psychology has shown empirically that during an experience of wonder and awe, we reframe our sense of self and world, and that this ability to accept a new larger reality inspires us to feel small in the face of such vastness. In coming into contact with this small self frame of reference, we diminish emphasis on the individual self and self-serving interests in favor of a more altruistic perspective. We literally become more compassionate, helpful, and ethically oriented. Wonder connects us to our world and to each other in measurable ways. It seems significant in our moment of social and environmental turbulence to consider how human encounters with the wonders of our natural world might contribute to compassionate, helpful, and ethically oriented decision making. Wonder is a component to curiosity. We can peer across the origins of our many cultures and see that encounters with the wonders of our world have sparked some of humanity's greatest leaps of creativity and accomplishment, from our first representative paintings on a cave wall to our first steps on the moon. I've become curious about whether seeking wonder engagement could have a significant impact on our ability to face the deepening complexities of the Anthropocene. Gazing up the starry universe, has sparked awe and wonder across time, giving rise to worldviews, cosmologies, and traditions, motivating art, literature, and architecture, and guiding traditional knowledge, philosophies, and science. As far back as we can see in the material re remains of our species lineage, 
cultures have looked to the stars to answer some of the most fundamental human questions, whether to locate and understand our place in the universe or to reflect on the meaning of our lives. In my lifetime, humans have proved the long held theory that we are actually made of the same stuff as the stars. This idea is most often attributed to Carl Sagan, but the concept of and ideas the, and the words themselves have been put forth by a handful of scientists dating back to the early 20th century, including Harvard College Observatory Director Harlow Shapley. In 1929, Shapley is quoted in the New York Times as having said, we are made of the same stuff as the stars. So when we study astronomy, we are in one, we are in a way only investigating our remote ancestry and our place in the universe of star stuff. Our varied bodies consist of the same chemicals, chemical elements found in the most distant nebulae and our activities are guided by the same universal rules. I am an amalgam of breath and starfire, rhythm and spin. The mere half century of my appellation betrays my true age, for I am 13.8 billion years old, the oldest part of me, a bonded, of river, a bonded river of hydrogens and oxygen that flows through each of my cells, a veritable storm of ancient stars and pre-star matter. To look into my eyes is to see all my former selves, from the exhalations of dying suns to the exhalations of living species. I have been galaxy, planet, tree, ocean, rock, flesh, and bone, and a thousand other things. It is said that while the universe was breathing its first breath and growing to the size of a human eye, time marked impatiently the passing of an instant before I was born as hydrogen. In quick succession, relatively speaking, and as environs cooled imperceptibly, I arrived as helium, then lithium. I could, it would then take many hundreds of thousands to millions of years before I would emerge as the first stable atomic elements and become the first stars. A billion years later, I would be the rest of the natural elements. Slowly, over these 13.8 billion years, stellar processes became planetary processes, became geologic processes, became biological processes. Where might you encounter these most ancient versions of me today? As hydrogen, I am older than the stars themselves, and yet I am in every living cell. I scribe the DNA of all living beings. In, as helium, I conjure sunlight and dissolve out of air into your blood as you breathe. As lithium, I am the lightest of the metals and can be traced within plants, rocks, and waters. My appearance across all of these, my appearance across these and all the subsequent elements, elements returns eternal. For what part of me is not also part of you? The mass of the human body measures 10% hydrogen and 90% stardust. After hydrogen, the next 25 elements of the periodic table up to iron were all formed by nuclear fusion within stars. The, imagine, the, re, the remaining natural elements formed through stellar deaths and elemental decay. There is nothing in our natural world we can touch that is not made from cosmic processes. And so in every meeting of our sun's light or rock or tree or animal or every breath in our atmosphere or drink of water, we encounter our cosmic ancestry. If sun, rock, tree, animal, air, and water are collaborators in Earth's systems and life-making elements, why do we not treat them as kin? Why does an elemental, what does an elemental empathy look like where each element that contributes to the body of the cosmos, the body of a planet, the bodies of humans and other than human bodies are revered? It is a curious and cruel hierarchy for humans to presume status above that which is made of, that, that which it belongs to. If empathy is a form of reciprocal deep listening, then an empathy of the elements would ask us to feel into all the facets of faceted complexity of our world as kin from the first breath of the early universe to the breath we are taking in this very moment. From the moment the first rock held in warm hands met the human gaze of curiosity, the lithic realm found invitation into the evolving and restless human imagination. The earliest artworks were carved in stone by stone. Stone has been medium, tool, and canvas for our earliest visions, innovations, and inquiry. 
Our relationship with the lithic spans at least 2.6 million years and touches cultures from prehistory to this moment. We still collect, carve, utilize, and cherish stones. From the purest mineral forms to weathered beach cobbles, our passion for lithic engagement seems almost instinctual. But what drives this nearly conate relationship between human and rock, this intimacy between the animate and inanimate worlds? I have been passionate about stones for as long as I can remember. I know that I'm not alone in this love of stone and that rock collectors everywhere adore each and every stone they pick up. Stones become portals of deep time and connect our imaginations to unknown landscapes. The story of human intrigue and reverence for stone appears across all cultures. Stones are, in essence, time travelers. Some stones are space explorers, having arrived to Earth from other planets after a journey through our solar system and even from beyond. I like to think of rocks as scrolls of knowledge passed down through the cosmic, planetary, and geologic ages that tell the story of primordial formation. In picking up a, a rock along a shoreline or mountain path, we evoke a moment when these forces meet the human mind and heart. We gaze into its complex structure to know something of its secrets, awaiting its tome of cosmic riddles to unravel. If one knows the language written in the stones, the stories begin to emerge. In my inquiry into the connection between living beings and lithic beings, I like to imagine that something of a shared chemi chemical inheritance lingers, like natural memory, beckoning our wonder to excavate our shared sidereal origins. Somewhere in the fiery core of ancient stars is written the verse to the molecules in your body. Somewhere in the microscopic glint of a space traveling rock is written the verse to the molecules in your body. Somewhere in the heart of your human chemistry is written the connection with the universe around you. In the presence of the infinitude of cosmic, planetary, and geologic timescales, the human timescale, the cycle of one human life, can feel staggeringly brief and separate from the continuum. Yet from wielding stone to building telescopes, human curiosity can now gaze back some 13.8 billion years across cosmic time to when the elements which comprise stone and flesh first began to form. Do we not then, in some poetic sense, occupy the same space as infinity? Perhaps this is why we have looked to stones for eons, because in a similar poetic sense, stones are a pathway toward the infinite. If stones hold memory, then meteorites that have been picked up by human hands have a particularly unique and intricate story to tell, one that spans remnant stellar chemistry, the forming and collision of planets out of pre-nebular dust and human curiosity, these rocks from space have been culturally revered for millennia. One of the earliest known artifacts denoting the meeting of humans and meteorites are nine small hand-formed beads found in Egypt that were made by hammering meteoritic iron with a tool made of earth and rock. They are considered to be the earliest examples of metalwork, metalwork and tell the unlikely but nevertheless true story of a stone from one planet body being used to reform the stone of another all by the force of human creativity. Yet the meteorites themselves were an amalgam of elements forged during the formation of the solar system and hammered by the force of much larger rocks through the cataclysm of planetary breakup and bombardment. Although at vastly different mag magnitudes, how elegant the symmetry, but the same elements of rock, heat, and force were required to create both a meteorite that fell from its original planetoid to Earth and a bead made from that meteorite to adorn a living being. Might the human who have created these, these beads have somehow sensed the remarkable story that lay buried in its mineral structure? Certainly they may have known these stones fell from the sky as there are records of meteorite falls dating back millennia, including a crater to the south of Egypt now thought to have, trans, thought to have formed at about the same period. The Egyptian word associated with iron literally translates to mean iron from the sky. Meteorites have touched imaginations and emotions across history. They were worshiped and sometimes feared by so many cultures across the ages that volumes have been written about their veneration and significance. Various cultures believed they were sent by the gods. Some thought they were the gods themselves. Others thought they were endowed with souls. They held many and sometimes contradictory meanings as talisman, bad omen, and possessors of powers that could start and end wars. Meteorites are intensely studied by scientists all over the world, the science of meteoritics having come into being in the early 1800s. From these stones, lengthy scrolls of cosmochemistry and physical features, we have learned the age of the earth, 
and the formation timeline of the early solar system. We have discovered grains of material that literally predate our solar system, grains that would be older than 4.6 billion years. We can read the signature of time passing to know how long ago a meteorite fell to Earth and how long ago its various minerals and clasts were formed. We can read the cataclysmic events that it encountered because this physical shock is still visible in the mineral structure. We've classified many varying types of meteorites and have correlated them to asteroids, recounting the story of the ancient planet bodies. We have deciphered in the microcosm of meteorites the script of water and the building blocks of life and the rock's collaboration in bringing these elements along with others to Earth. And we have read in our Earth's topography their collisions with our planet and the part they played in certain aspects of our own planet's formation and biological evolution. Written in the great volumes of Earth's stratigraphy, there is one ancient layer of rock that has particular meaning to us humans, a thin layer of claystone about one centimeter thick. This layer in the geologic record has been found at locations across the globe to contain high percentages of meteoritic material, the aftermath of the cataclysmic force of the Chicxulub asteroid hitting our planet 66 million years ago. Estimated to have been up to nine miles wide and with the impact equivalents of several million nuclear weapons, to say this rock shook the very foundation of our planet would not be overstating it. Known as the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, nearly 75 of all species perished. No four-legged land creature over 55 pounds survived and die-offs among plants, plankton and marine animals devastated global ecosystems. This stark reminder that we live amidst a dynamic solar system that continues its restless legacy of collision events should not overshadow the incredible tenacity that life has expressed again and again on this planet. Over the tens of thousands of years of rebounding organisms and adaptations that followed the mass extinction, what is remarkable is that this asteroid impact made room for certain mammal species to radiate including the one we evolved from. How poignant and poetic that a stone large enough to decimate one era of species yielded conditions for the emergence of another species, one which would come to love stone in a symbolic and ritualized way over millennia, eventually creating the science and technology that would reveal this story. A species that could reflect on its own place in the geologic tomes it could now read. When headlines raced across global news outlets in the spring of 2019, revealing that 1 million species are at risk of extinction, I was in the meteorite lab at Johnson Space Center taking this stone's portrait. I was photographing this and other rich, carbon rich meteorites that formed in the early solar system from my project at NASA which is an effort to bring the stories of these pieces of our solar system to people more widely as a way of connecting to our, soul, to our cosmic heritage and our natural world, a connection that we have all but forgotten. The headlines words felt heavy and wrenching, bringing a confluence of thoughts and emotions that pointed to the increasing complexity of being a human at this moment on earth. Standing in the lab trying to process the horror of, the impending, of an impending extinction of one million species, feeling weightless as my heart fell into a void of interwoven emotions, I looked at this tiny meteoritic stone, fragment of a primordial planet body, as if for solace and gravity. This stone, called LON 94102, is a type of meteorite known as a CM2 carbonaceous chondrite and is comprised of material that formed around 4.56 billion years ago. This space stone in particular is known for being quite rich in amino acids and nucleobases, compounds necessary in biologic processes. Current scientific understanding is that meteorites such as these may have delivered a significant source of prebiotic material to the early earth from which chemical processes and primitive life evolved. It is a stunning thing to gaze into the face of a 4.56 billion year old lithic elder that holds the story of how life's building blocks arrived to earth, 
while simultaneously feeling the weight of a mass extinction of the life that has evolved hence. Each of the chemical elements that have evolved life's processes can in one way or another be traced back to the cosmos, across the cosmos to the birth and death of the earliest stars, the pre-cloud, the pre-solar cloud from which our own sun emerged, and eventually to the time when stones like this one were formed and flung towards earth to begin the planetary, geologic and biologic processes that we are so indebted to for life. How are we beholden to act towards all of life's and nature's processes given such a lineage? Perhaps an empathy for the entangled web of our world is not a succumbing to the temptation to anthropomorphize the non-human, but rather it is to see the non-human without succumbing to the temptation of objectification. One of the responsibilities that I feel artistic knowledge has in collaboration with scientific knowledge is to nurture and defend the important role that feeling meaning has in the search for understanding the mechanisms of our world, that meaning is as important as truth. Feeling value plays a critical role in our ability to maintain our sense of humanity. And it has become coming ever more discussed as this summit so clearly illustrates that the role of empathetic exchange across disciplines may well define the future of problem solving and our ability to balance the many social and environmental challenges we face as a species. How far reaching is our capacity to connect ourselves to our world? Could the practice of engaging in states of wonder every day help us remember and maintain our eons long connection and love for the world that evolved us? Can wonder lead to an emp empathetic response to our current, current environmental and social predicaments, reminding us that we are connected to the entire cosmos? The story of connection and belonging is all around us, in the rocks under our feet, in the soil, water, plants, trees, and the many beings among us, and in the starfire elements that comprise our hearts and minds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, really thoughtful way to uh, start to conclude our second day of the summit. Elif, I, I turn it to you to um, offer some reflections and perhaps engage with Erica as, as I take a look at any comments that might have come in. Uh, whenever I hear Erica speak and you know share her the way she sees the universe, just makes me so emotional. Uh, and and um, really, I mean, maybe we shouldn't even talk. <laughs> But, but with that, there are things to be said, you know, and, and thank you so much for this, you know, incredible perspective, incredible perspective, it's so unique and so necessary. And if I may, I just would like to share some personal reflections at a personal level, you know, and, 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 and this reminded me, our connections to the, the minerals and this, you know, this one single source of life that exploded, you know, billions and billions of years ago. And um, I mean, I think, I think what I'm gonna say is that, I mean, this whole uh, journey that you took us through reminded me of uh, the ceremony that the dervishes uh, performed, the prayer, the whirling ceremony that they uh, performed. It's not a performance, of course, it's a form of prayer, but uh, I didn't know how to put the words together. Um, and, uh, and, Culturally, actually, that, that whole ceremony begins, you know, we, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if, Erica, if you were there, but we saw just a little glimpse of the, of a live, you know, SEMA ceremony um, uh, as it was ending. And, and if you may have noticed that there was this like instruments playing and then there was complete silence as the dervishes were whirling. So th that was, I think, the, the towards the end of becoming human or receiving this sort of knowledge and wisdom. But in the beginning, the whole ceremony begins with a big bang, literally on a on a on an instrument of you know the, a drum, and then that symbolizes this uh, the oneness of the source of life, and then 
the, as the dervishes, you know, uh, do their thing and they're, you know, meditating, they represent going through the stages of life as minerals and rocks. And then the second time they circle the, this, uh, the uh, area as uh, vegetation and then as animals and then as human beings, at which point have this receptivity to receive something else other than the other creation had, uh, which is perhaps our ability or capacity for love and empathy and all the other, other species have it too. So maybe that's our the, the secret that Kabir Dada was mentioning yesterday. You know, may uh, may his secret be safe. Maybe that's our human secret. And I think this is just such a beautiful way of um, your your presentation. That just just looking at that rock, that mineral, uh, just brought me back to that performance and. It just symbolizes oneness, you know. <laughs> I mean, like, and and the way that we humans can, I think, we are trying to now wrap our heads around this concept of like how we evolved and came. And of course, there are many ways of looking at it. You know, what we are talking is just our way of looking at it, perhaps. But then, uh, I think I realize that what I'm trying to do, or empathy to me, is a way of my yearning to find my way back to my original state of oneness. And, and, you know, and to do that, I realize I have this urge to experience it through the natural history and museums are the perfect you know, uh, platforms for that, I think, you know, because you can actually experience what Winslow said also, reality in different ways. Um, and, and, and there's one other thing that it's, a, again, it's a, just a personal thing I'm going on, but, um, Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> and uh, this, um, this, uh, this thing, this, uh, this letter uh, that was actually, um, and anyway, it, is, uh, it symbolizes the life source in, in, in the path that I'm on. It's uh, who, and uh, that's what dervishes world to. And I noticed that in one of the, the light images that you have, it looked very much like this, and I would love to know where to find that image so I can maybe uh, keep a copy for myself. <laughs> and uh, again, I'm sorry that I, this was this is just very personal to me because it's it is my own journey, and I'm learning so much. And uh, I can't thank you enough, and thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> uh, Elif, thank you so much. Um, I think your your personal reflections are mirrored in some of the comments from uh, some of our participants. I'm particularly struck by um, the, the simplicity of, of what Lottie shares about the, the, the joy she finds in stones, um, having been a, a former park ranger. But even if you weren't a park ranger, the, the joy that you find in stones or um, a leaf, we were talking about uh, it, the, you know, a, a leaf, you presented the idea of the, the, the the image of a leaf and everything that it brings, the complexity. And um, I'm wondering also, Erica, I was thinking about your comment, and I might not have gotten this right, but where you said, wonder has gravity. I, I thought that was such a profound statement and uh, a number of our colleagues in the chat box seem to respond to it as well, that in fact, the the, a practice of engaging, I think Kirsten, you might have said this, the practice of engaging in states of wonder every day, that's what museums can do as facilitators of wonder. And so taking this concept of wonder and giving it gravity and shape and form in a museum experience, um, really powerful. Thank you, I, I really appreciate and um, I'm grateful for all your reflections and, and feedback and and I I feel like the you know practicing wonder daily um, has been something that I've I have been doing as an artist um, in my work very consciously um, for a long time now and I I I feel like that's what has taught me um, how to listen across time and how to listen deeply to, to the non-human um, or other than human beings that we 
we share this universe here. Um, and I, I think that that gravity that I feel is, is this desire to maintain that sort of reverent belonging that, that I think is so key in, in what stimulates our feelings of, of connection. Um, and I do think that you're exactly right, that these, these practices of daily wonder um, are, are things that we can all do. And certainly museums, I think, attempt that. I think that is, I mean, I, I think, and, and we can all um, become more conscious of it, right? Um, and I think that's, that's perhaps um, where our pathway, where our pathway is. Um, but I think that, that, I mean, you know, I think about the fact that we're made of stars like literally every day, like usually more than once <laughs> a day. And um, I just, I'm sort of obsessed with this idea that, that, that we can, um, we can feel that in ourselves. Like when I'm feeling something, I can also, that part of me is stars feeling what I'm feeling. Like there's this, there's, if we if we take the continu the continuum of time and we um, and we allow for that sort of sense of infiniteness, um, I think that we can we can hold it. We we are complex beings. We can hold complexity, um, and we should we should expand our abilities to do that whenever we can. Well, I wonder if you. Um... Erica, as you're talking, I'm looking and seeing that Kirsten has a, a couple of really uh, rich comments. And Kirsten, please feel free to um, join us if, if you would like to. Um, but the, the first question that Kirsten had was, how do we take this concept, this sense of awe and wonder that we're talking about and the empathy that we've been talking about now for a couple of days, and how do we tackle difficult topics, the challenging topics that museums are increasingly being asked to address. Did I get that right, Kirsten? Yes, I hope it, I hope I made myself clear. I just think sometimes they seem like opposites. I, I don't want them to be, but I just feel like I need to reconcile that. In what sense do you feel like they're opposites? Maybe I want to make sure I understand your question. Well, I think um, instilling a sense of wonder or practicing daily wonder uh, tends to be, if we're going to look at a, a spectrum of um, positive to negative, for, I don't know if that's the right way to look at it, that wonder feels like it's more on the positive end than the negative end. And so we were just talking about um, you know, having people go through experiences, actually being in an experience that might be a trauma-based experience. How do we have wonder in that? <laughs> I, that's a difficult question. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure we, should we look for wonder in trauma? Like I, or, or maybe not trauma, but in horror, like the, the circumstances that produce the trauma. I mean, I think what one of the things that comes to mind, at least initially, is that we can find places of wonder in how we um, live through those experiences, right? Um, I mean, certainly whether there are technological crises or environmental crises that we survive um, or, and political crises that we survive, um, there's ways that humans come together in extraordinary ways that where we can find wonder. And I think if wonder is an expression of love, then, then we can look to places where there is love that emerges from, from difficult and challenging scenarios, right? Um, and I think perhaps this last year and a half has been a really um, critical learning experience for all of us in that, you know, globally, is like, where are we going to place our sense of connection and love and how are we going to see, each, see ourselves as living on this planet together? Um, 
I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I think it feels to me like that's maybe a place to start. You absolutely did. Thank you. That was a really, really helpful response. Kirsten, thanks so much for that. Um, as, as Erica, as you're talking, I'm considering my experience at, for example, the National 9-11 Memorial and Museum or at the Holocaust Memorial Museum, both places, very difficult places, places of immense loss and tragedy. <clears throat> and yet, as I think, Kirsten, you just brought back into the conversation, emerging with a sense of, of resilience, um, wonder at the complexity of the tragedy in, in the truest sense, how could this happen? And then the wonder of us as uh, surviving this and, and the resilience that comes with it. So I don't know if that's the, the same thing that you were getting at, Kirsten, but that's what your, your observation made me think of. I, it, the research that, that um, the research that I was looking into, um, and I just want to name Dasher Keltner from University of California in Berkeley, who, who runs the, the group that does the, the study, um, studied, um, he specifically was interested in awe, and, and then through that discovered that there were um, variances in how people would respond to awe experiences that were possibly more on the negative side of, of things versus wonder. And, and so I sort of chose in, in my thinking about this to focus on the places where, where wonder kind of sparks imagination. And because I think, you know, there are certainly experiences, certainly people have experiences of nature um, and, and, and that world that is, um, that is challenging and difficult that we would say are, are we were all filled, you know? Um, but I think that as we, as we look to um, sort of expose places where we can create more empathetic responses, it's in the wonder-filled um, spectrum of encounters that, that we can focus. And I think what my experience has been around that is, is everybody has to, I, I feel this way because I feel like this is how I've had to do it, but you have to sort of go at your own speed. Like it's, it's so individual. I mean, there, I lived in the, in the desert in the Southwest for many, many years and loved it. But there are, there are humans that don't love that, that vast sky and, and the vast landscape. Um, and I think, you know, people meeting the natural environment where they are and letting themselves um, explore into what, what it feels like, even if it just means going into your backyard and picking up a stone and, and learning what you can learn from, from it. I think that there's, there's, um, there has to be recognition that, that humans, humans experience, encounter, and learn differently. Um, but I think one of the things that, um, one of the things that I learned from, from Keltner's work is that, is that wonder explicitly leads to empathetic and compassionate um, responses. And, and the, the wonder that I'm talking about is that sense of joy and that sense of recognition and love and the capacity to um, feel a part of something even, it's almost like our egos get in the way. And so this idea of like, you know, we, we become small, in our frame of reference that allows the rest of the world to join us in our experience and our encounter. I think there's something, there's something really important to that. Thank you, Erica. And um, I see a, a, one of our colleagues said, 
all of this wonder in is really quite remarkable. And I think that's a, a lovely way for us to wrap up our program today. Alif, anything that you would like to close with before we officially sign off for the afternoon? Um, I just would like to thank everyone again, all the speakers and uh, Erica, uh, lastly, for taking us on this uh, really, really incredible journey. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I hope we can do this in person someday, you know, the where we are all in the same space and we can just continue our conversations over a cup of tea or coffee or something like that. And hopefully that'll happen. And uh, talking about tea and coffee, uh, we, uh, I did uh, include in my welcome email that uh, some uh, friends in the DC area uh, are getting together tonight at 5.30 uh, at a small restaurant near Foggy Bottom Metro uh, called Tonic uh, from 5.30 to 7. Some friends will be there uh, uh, from the summit. And if you have other colleagues, friends from your uh, area in where you are, uh, perhaps you, know, uh, you can also take the opportunity to meet over a, uh, over a drink or something. And uh, just to keep the social, uh, uh, element in our in our minds that we are social beings and maybe we should also be near each other uh, so if anybody can join us uh, that'd be good and I, I'll probably be a little late but uh, I hope to join uh, and um, thank you thank you for being here and we'll see you tomorrow I hope you can join us tomorrow again uh, and I think Greg is sharing with us some of the upcoming uh, presentations Tomorrow is going to be another uh, exciting day uh, with a, a panel discussion in the morning. Oh, that's at the very end. <laughs> uh, uh, about uh, making space. Yay! Uh, in the morning, uh, we have uh, uh, six unique uh, approaches to making space for empathy building. And Andrew will join us again uh, at that panel with a performance. Uh, so we will get a chance to actually feel uh, what he was uh, talking about earlier today. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we have a panel uh, of colleagues from Seattle Aquarium and the Woodland Park Zoo talking about empathy building in action. What does that look like in a, a museum, uh, in, in this case, zoos and aquariums, uh, to build empathy? And what does that take? And, and uh, how the institution and the employees respond, how the communities respond, and what, what we can learn from their experience. Uh, and, and the last hour, I think, on our day, uh, which is going to be the last day uh, tomorrow, uh, will be uh, our chance to share our intentions and commitments before we leave uh, the summit. Uh, but the workshops are still continuing. So the right next day, you know, the, on Saturday, we have Edwin Rush's uh, Empathic Listening Circles. Uh, 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 workshop. Uh, there's a Zoom link there. You don't need to register. I mean, you you can also just join in. Basically, uh, we wanted you to sign up so we know we knew how many people would be there. Uh, but uh, Edwin made uh, his uh, personal Zoom uh, link available for this event, so um, it's not going to be through Greg and I. Uh, and then. Uh, on November 2nd, we have the Empathic Intervision uh, friends, uh, Lidaway and Catherine, uh, who will lead us through a workshop on using empathy uh, to unpack climate change. So uh, I hope you can join us uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. Great, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Be well. <laughs>